Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are just short of quorum. If there's any councillors in the ante room that can hear me, please make your way in. We are less than one minute to start time. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. It is now 1.05, and I'd like to call the meeting to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. Other individuals in the media may also be audibly and or visually recording this meeting, as well a reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during the committee meeting. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, although they're not technically changes to the agenda, you do have added appendices A through F to item 6.1 before you for information. All right, thank you. Um, I need a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as presented. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Wilson, that is an e vote, please. And that carries. Thank you. Uh, are there any declarations of interest for today's meeting? Seeing none, we'll now move on to staff presentations. And uh, this is about Grids 2 and Municipal Comprehensive Review, and it is a workshop. So I'll call down for item 6.1, Joanne Hickey Evans, who is the Manager of Policy Planning and Zoning Bylaw Reform for the City of Hamilton, and Anthony Laureus, Principal Laureus and Associates, and Heather Travis, Senior Project Manager for Growth Management Strategy for the City of Hamilton. They'll be doing today's presentation. And as I understand, it will be a somewhat lengthy presentation. So at the end of the presentation, we will ask uh, the presenters to sit down and then we'll take questions from the floor. Thank you. Start whenever you're ready, please. So, I'm a tad taller. Good afternoon, members of committee, staff, and public. Thank you for attending today's presentation on growth management in the city. The goal of today is to share information and provide education. No decisions or recommendations are requested or included as part of this workshop. In this workshop, we will provide you with an overview of the city's current growth strategy, commonly known as GRIDS, an update to GRIDS, which we've called GRIDS 2, and finally, the Municipal Comprehensive Review Process, also an acronym, MCR. We will explain how intensification and density are addressed and how these matters affect the city's land needs assessment, the LNA. The presentation will outline key decision points and timelines for these processes. As Councillor Partridge said, the, the presentation is fairly long, and there's a lot of information before you. So our approach to this workshop is to make the presentation and have questions at the end. On your blotter, we've provided some handouts to aid in this presentation, including a definition sheet, larger maps, and the Airport Employment Growth District, known as the AGD Minutes of Settlement. I will get this. Oh, boy, the arrow was worn off. <laughs> Let's show us how well it's used. So as the introductions that Councillor Partridge uh, talked about, I will be making a presentation on the history of the city's first growth strategy. Anthony Laureus from Laureus & Associates We'll talk about the various targets and intensification rates from a, both a supply and demand perspective. And Heather will talk about the grids to and MCR processes, as well as to share with you how these targets affect how much the, sand, the city, city needs land the city needs to accommodate our future population and employment forecasts. So the agenda is on the screen. So we're going to start off with what is growth management? explain how grids came to be. Then we're gonna talk about the process that's currently underway, which is grids two in the Municipal Comprehensive Review. And in terms of the grids update in the Municipal Comprehensive Review process, we'll talk about how targets and po of population, targets, population employment forecasts are addressed through residential intensification, 
greenfield and employment areas. We'll also explain how these targets and work from targets from the growth plan are assessed as part of our land needs assessment. We'll talk about opportunities and constraints for the evaluation and growth. And finally, we will conclude with the next step and where we are going. So on the screen in front of you is a timeline that provides a roadmap going forward as to how and when the results of the various studies will be presented to committee. It identifies public engagement opportunities as well as key decision points. As some of you may recall, the first phase of, phase of this project included a report to GIC, approved by council, to, that identified how the city has grown over the last 2000, between 2006 and 2016, and how we've met our various density and intensification targets. As you can see, we are very early on in the process and there are many opportunities and ways to provide input. It is expected that GRIDS2 and MCR will wrap up in the fall of 2020. So what is growth management? To be clear, growth management is not an urban boundary exercise. It evaluates when, where, and how we grow. It, for, it plans for where people will live, it plans for areas where people will work and where businesses can establish. Growth management is strategic. It's a long-term view. It's, it's a comprehensive and integrated approach, which includes demographic and economic forecasting, employment trends, land use planning, transportation and infrastructure planning, as well as financial analyses. The context from a land use planning perspective, as it relates to growth, is largely driven by the 2019 growth plan. So you hear, you've heard us talk about the growth plan, and I'm sure very many of you are familiar. But just to recap, the first growth plan was released by the province in 2006. Or 20, ugh, 2006. It planned for growth until the year 2031. And it was one of the fundamental bases of GRIDS. What is it? It's the province's vision as to how and where new jobs and people will be accommodated. The time horizon for the 2019 growth plan has been extended to 2041. The plan includes population and employment forecasts for each region and one tier municipality. These forecasts are used by the city to plan for housing, employment, hard and soft services, infrastructure, transportation, among other matters. It also contains intensification and density targets for different parts of the city. The intent of the growth plan in 2006 was to shift growth patterns into a more compact form by having a greater proportion of housing in medium and high density forms. So what is GRIDS? After amalgamation, the city prepared its very first comprehensive strategy to guide growth until the year 2031. It integrated land use, transportation, infrastructure, along with economic and the social development strategies. It also included a financial impact assessment for the preferred growth option. The selected growth option was based on a nose and corridors system. Equally important to Grizz was that the key drivers for the last two development charges bylaw, which includes a 2019 update. On the next few slides, I'm going to highlight for you the process that was used in the determination of the preferred growth option. After amalgamation, the city embarked on a program known as Building a Strong Foundation. This program combined and aligned Vision 2020, GRIDS, the official plans, the master plans, and other supporting strategies and implementation tools. One of the first steps in this process was the renewal of Vision 2020. And if some of you, I'm sure many people are, are aware of Vision 2020, it was the precursor to this, the uh, strategy that we have today. It was developed originally in 1992. 
So as part of this renewal of Vision 2020, at the time, we thought it was very important to develop, not develop directions to guide development. And there are nine, oh, I'm way past myself. There are nine in front of you. These directions are based on a number of themes, including encouraging compatible mix of land uses to support opportunities to live, work, play, and learn, making more efficient use of our transportation, our infrastructure, our existing buildings. It protects rural area with a strong agricultural economy, as well as protecting our ecological systems. What's important about these nine directions is that they were part of the evaluation of the growth options. And they're also actually included in both the rural and urban Hamilton official plans. So the first step when we embarked on this growth strategy was to develop three growth concepts. No urban boundary expansion was one, appropriately distributed development, and finally downtowns and nodes and corridors concept. These concepts were further refined into five specific growth options. These options were tested to determine what infrastructure and transportation requirements were needed to support each of these options, as well as how they aligned with the city's economic and social development strategies. So in addition to the nine directions I spoke about, as well as provincial policy directions, the growth options were also evaluated using the triple bottom line evaluation framework, commonly known as TBL. This framework establishes economic, community, and environmental factors, and it's used in the decision-making process. It's important to note there is no specific requirement that each of these three considerations have to be balanced. Although these factors are not necessarily balanced at all times, sometimes choices have to be made. And we can think of this framework as a tricycle. If the front wheel is the economy and the rear wheels are the community and, and environmental consideration, if one of these wheels falls off, then the tricycle will not move forward. So very quickly, under the community considerations, there were 15 measures used to assess the growth options. They were focused on a variety of factors that help to contribute to a strong and safe community. On the environmental side, there were 13 measures, including the protection and preservation of agricultural land, natural heritage, air and water, and other considerations. And the third set was the economy, and it had 15 measures specifically aligned to it. It assessed economic considerations, and it focused on housing, the economic base, eco, agritourism, education, to name a few. So in May 2006, the city approved the preferred growth option, which was based on a nodes and corridor st structure. It was coupled with two urban boundary expansion areas, one for employment, whoops, One for employment that was centered around the airport, and the other is commonly known as El Frida. The various nodes included our downtown, two subregional nodes or higher nodes, which focused on Eastgate and Lime Ridge, and it was also supported by many other former municipal downtowns and center mall. Preferred growth option also identified a series of intensification areas. In September 20, 2006, Council further directed that the city staff incorporate looking at the lands commonly known as 20 Road East in the next municipal comprehensive review process, which is the one we're doing now. So 
So grids, the grids didn't just sit on the shelf. It has been implemented in many, many ways. The first was the adoption of the Rural Hamilton Official Plan in 2006, followed by the Urban Hamilton Official Plan, which is one of the key implementation mechanisms for grids. It established the policies for the implementation of the nodes and corridors system, protection of our employment areas, among other matters. It also identified two urban boundary expansion areas that I talked about. In October 2010, City Council approved the Airport Employment Growth District Secondary Plan and Associated Zoning. The plan was appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board, and the Ontario Municipal Board rendered a decision in February, the fi its final decision in February 2015. And the, as you can see between the two, the land area for the secondary plan was reduced. In addition, this uh, settlement or this uh, OMB decision included the minutes of settlement. And the minutes of settlement were between the city and a number of landowners. It identified Alfred as the first priority for development and future growth areas would be developed in an east and west direction. And then the last large uh, project relates to the future of Friday growth area study secondary plan. The subwatershed plan is, has been undertaken. The secondary plan exercise, though, is currently on hold pending the outcome of grids. Should also point out that the Afrida expansion area as it relates to the Urban Hamilton official plan is still before the LPAT. And if you have any specific questions about that, Mike Kovacevic from Legal Services uh, is here to answer any questions. So in addition to the big picture land use plans that I've just spoken about, there have been several other plans, projects, and approvals that have implemented the city's growth strategy over the next 12, 12 years as it relates to land use planning. So to give you a sense of the magnitude of the achievement since 2006, there have been 49 zones and several other regulations incorporated into zoning bylaw 05200, 11 new and updated secondary plans, 12,000 development applications, 800 heritage permits and designations, as well as 11 special studies for certain geographic or natural heritage system areas. Along the way, we also instituted a number of processes and open for business improvements. But as I said at the very beginning, this wasn't a land use planning exercise only. It also, transportation infrastructure improvements were very, very important. Again, over the last, I guess, 13 years, there have been a number of transportation infrastructure improvements. On the transportation slide, there's been significant investment from both the local and provincial levels. And you can also see that there's a series of infrastructure improvements. So at this point in the presentation, that provides a high level overview of GRIDS 2006. So from here, Heather will take over. Thank you, Joanne. Heather, welcome. Thank you. So GRIDS was completed in 2006. Since that time, new provincial growth forecasts to the year 2041 have been released, as well as updated provincial planning policies. The city has embarked on a process to update GRIDS, which we call GRIDS 2. Similar to the first GRIDS, GRIDS 2 is also an integrated planning process with updates to the infrastructure and transportation master plans included. And the outcome of GRIDS 2 will inform the next development charge bylaw update. GRIDS will be planning for the next 10 years of growth uh, from 21 to 31, sorry, 2031 to 2041, uh, as the first GRIDS plan to the year 2031. Concurrently with GRIDS 2, we're also completing the Municipal Comprehensive Review, or MCR. The MCR is a provincial requirement to update the city's official plans to conform to the updated provincial plans. So that's the growth plan, the Greenbelt plan, and the Niagara Escarpment plan. Like GRIDS 2, the MCR is planning to the year 2041, and as such, we've combined these two projects into one integrated process. 
So how much growth are we planning for? As Joanne noted, we receive our growth forecast from the growth plan. The growth plan forecasts for, are for a 2031 population of 680,000 people and 310,000 jobs, and a 2041 population of 780,000 people and 350,000 jobs. So this equates to a total increase of approximately 222,000 people and 147 jobs between 2016 and 2041, which we're planning for as part of this process. So this slide provides a high level comparison of GRIDS versus the GRIDS 2 process and how much growth each project is planning for. So as Joanne noted, the first GRIDS planned, had a planning horizon of 2001 to 2031. The growth being planned for was about 150,000 people, which equated to about 80,000 units. Through the first GRIDS process, it was determined that out of that 80,000 units, about 26,500 could be accommodated as intensification within our existing built-up area, and that another 32,000 units could be accommodated through the city's existing vacant land supply already within our urban area. So the problem statement for GRIDS was where would the remaining 21,500 units be allocated? And as Joanne noted, the determination was that the preferred growth area for new residential development was the Alfreda uh, future growth area. So looking to 2031 to 2041, which is the GRIDS 2 planning horizon, we know our forecast of growth is about 100,000 people, which is about 40,000 units in that time period. We're going to be talking today about intensification and targets in the growth plan. If we were planned to the minimum growth plan target, which is 50%, that would equate to 20,000 of those 40,000 units being accommodated through intensification. And we know that our vacant land supply within our urban area will be, will be already developed uh, by 2031. That will all be developed uh, as part of the first grids process that identified. So the question then is, where will the remaining 20,000 units be allocated? Again, that would be based on a 50% intensification, but as we're going to talk about today, we need to determine what is the appropriate target for Hamilton to plan to. And just as a side note, we do also need to review some of that, the 2031 information that came out of the GRIDS process uh, because the provincial forecasts for population have increased and we have different planning targets to plan for. So we'll be doing a 2031 update as well as planning for the next 10 years of growth. So we've defined a four-phase approach to the GRIDS 2 MCR process. Joanne noted that phase one as part of phase one, we had completed a, a growth summary that uh, provided a high-level overview of how the city's grown from 2006 to 2016. That was the background review which set the stage for uh, the second phase, which is what we're currently in with the MCR, which is a, the completion of a number of background studies which staff have been working on. That includes employment land review, uh, tr planning around major transit station areas, and intensification update. Phase three will be the completion of the land needs assessment, including the identification of intensification and density targets for the city and residential and employment land needs. And this will be, this phase three will really be the focus of today's uh, presentation. And phase four will commence following the completion of the land needs assessment. If the land needs assessment identifies the need for additional lands to accommodate growth, we will then be looking at the evaluation of where that growth should occur. As I mentioned, a focus of today's presentation is major elements that are going to feed into the city's land needs assessment and the land needs assessment itself. Uh, so at a high level, the land needs assessment, or LNA, determines how much of the city's forecasted growth can be accommodated in the existing urban boundary and how much may be required to be accommodated through future urban boundary expansion. In order to determine this outcome, there are important inputs into the LNA required including an intensification target and a greenfield density target, which we're going to focus on today. So starting with intensification, at a high level, what is intensification? The Provincial Policy Statement, or PPS, defines intensification as the development of a property, site, or area at a higher density than currently exists. This could be through redevelopment, development of previously underutilized lots, infill, or conversions. Intensification at this, with this definition can take place anywhere throughout the city, anywhere within the urban area, including greenfield areas.
Growth through intensification has long been a policy goal at both the provincial and the local level. There are many benefits to planning for increased intensification, including supporting transit ridership, reducing the amount of new greenfield land required, and the development of complete communities. Intensification is often promoted as a way to save on infrastructure, but it's not always the case. If capacity doesn't exist and upsizing or upgrading is required, then those savings would not be realized. So an important consideration moving forward is the difference between the broad definition of intensification that I just described, which can occur anywhere throughout the city, versus intensification as considered in a, in a growth plan context. When the growth plan speaks to intensification and the intensific intensification target, it's referring to the number of new units constructed annually within the built-up area. So the built-up area is shown very conceptually on this map, oh, on the map on the screen, but I'll be able to show it in more detail on the next slide. Uh, generally, the built-up area is a smaller subset of the urban area. So the growth plan measures intensification as occurring within the built-up area. The takeaway point here is that the general term of intensification can occur anywhere throughout the urban area, but the growth plan target is measured in only the built-up area, so they're not quite the same. So this is the slide that I was referring to. It shows that built-up area in more detail. Uh, on the screen, the black dotted line is the urban boundary. All the gray area on the, on the outside is our rural area. The lands within the dotted line are the city's urban area. You'll see some white uh, patches or, or holes scattered throughout that urban area. Those are our designated greenfield lands. So they're part of the urban area, but they do not form part of the built-up area. And the built-up area is all the area in red that you can see on the screen. The built-up area was defined by the province in 2006 and generally corresponded to the built-up portions of the city at that time. Since that time, some of the greenfield areas have actually been developed as well, but the built boundary line has not changed. So the built-up area remains the same as it did in 2006. So the greenfield intensification target applies to all lands within that built-up area. Hamilton's target is 50%, meaning 50% of new units must be con constructed within the built-up area each year. And this is an increase from the target under the previous growth plan, the 2006 version, which had been 40%. So it's important to note that the growth plan target is a minimum. The city can set a higher target than mandated by the growth plan or the city may apply to the province for approval of a lower target, an alternative target. But this would require approval from the minister and there's no guarantee that that approval would be granted. So how has Hamilton been performing in terms of intensification in recent years? The graph on the side shows that Hamilton's intensification rate has fluctuated on a yearly basis, averaging approximately 30 to 40% of new units. This variation is to be expected and will likely continue. Uh, the number of permits, this is measured based on the number of building permits and the permits certainly do fluctuate each year. Uh, one large multi-residential development, for instance, can have a significant impact on the overall, overall rate. And you will notice that in 2018, the city did reach an intensification rate of 50% for the first time. So then going forward, <clears throat> how do we determine an appropriate intensification target for Hamilton? We know the growth plan target is a minimum, and the city has the ability to set a higher target or apply for an alternative lower target. And we also know the city has been averaging between 30 and 40% intensification over the past decade. So how do we determine an appropriate target for Hamilton? To do so, we need to look at the supply and demand for intensification units in the city. Theoretically, the supply of potential intensification units is large, with uh, downtown Hamilton, particularly in light of the recently updated secondary plan and zoning, waterfront, other nodes and corridors and infill opportunities. But we also know that theoretical supply is almost always larger than demand. So the question is how much intensification will Hamilton actually realize by 2041? To help us answer this question, we retained Anthony Laureus from Laureus and Associates to prepare a residential intensification market demand study and Anthony is here today to share with us some of the preliminary findings from that report. It's not yet complete. So I'm going to turn it over to Anthony now, and he'll lead us through a discussion of his early findings, and then he'll also lead us into a discussion of greenfield density and employment areas. So thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Heather and Anthony. Welcome.
Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. So from a, from a housing perspective, intensification can occur across a range of forms and throughout the urban area depending on the definition in the PPS versus the definition in the growth plan. But um, from, a, from a market and a housing development perspective, it is predominantly the higher density forms, the apartments and the row houses and the stacked towns that we see most intensification occurring. And when we consider demand for those intensification units, there are really five big factors that are driving demand for intensification units. We have economic factors, uh, including immigration, that have driven strong population growth and strong housing growth, housing demand overall. We have the age structure of the population, which largely dictates housing choice by type. And these are very long and well-established demographic patterns, which tend to begin with young adults moving to the urban core for education and employment opportunities, usually occupying an apartment, typically rental, incomes rise, families are formed, and then demographic forces lead to an increased demand for family-oriented housing and family-sized housing. We have the available supply of housing units and, and, and more importantly, uh, elements of that which might be constrained, which affects the options available to satisfy that housing demand and in turn, housing cost and affordability, which as you might have seen, generally in the metropolitan area has led to a broad market shift to smaller and more affordable housing forms. And then on top of those broad economic and demographic forces, we have lifestyle factors which uh, for the purposes of intensification really is a broad shift or a growing preference to more cosmopolitan urban lifestyles, high amenity workspaces, you know, cool places to live. And that's one of the attractions that we have seen in the city of Toronto. The big takeaway from a demand perspective is that the level of intensification that occurs is driven by these broad metro-wide economic and demographic factors. Economic opportunity, job growth, immigration, and the attraction of the actual environment where intensification is going to occur. So what these are the main factors that really explain the historic concentration of intensification within the City of Toronto and the current boom that we're seeing for high-rise condos in downtown Toronto. We have very strong employment growth and not just any employment growth. It's growth in the tech sector, it's major office employment, it's professional services, it's high skill, higher wage opportunities. We've had a huge influx of millennials. You might have noticed that we have a huge affordability problem metro-wide and also in the city of Toronto. And so that's really part of the context that's driven this boom in what we see in the city of Toronto, but also the emergence of large-scale intensification in other parts of the metro area like Southern York Region, the Vaughan Metropolitan Centre with the subway to downtown Toronto, Kitchener-Waterloo, I think they have something in the neighbourhood of 50 projects along the Ion line, uh, and of course the city of Hamilton, and we know I think everyone can agree that the city is at least at the beginning of, of a real resurgence of growth and sort of a re-establishment of the city as a significant economic and cultural centre within the metropolitan region. So that's really the context for the forecast of market demand for intensification uh, is the emergence of the city as a significant centre within the metropolitan region. And I should also note that the forecasts that we have been working on, they're still at a preliminary level, the forecasts are being prepared for long-term planning purposes. They're not, they're not meant to address short-term cycles in terms of unit demand or pricing. They're what we expect to be the case over the very long term in Hamilton, over the period to 2041, as input to the land need assessment. And currently we have three market-based approaches which we have shown in terms of the share of units within the, the built boundary so we can compare it to the growth plan forecast, uh, or the growth plan requirement, I'm sorry. We have a current trends forecast, which is roughly 40% of new units. We have a high forecast at 48% of new units and a low forecast at just under 30% of new units inside the built boundary. And the low forecast is really what we would consider a pure sort of market-based forecast. This is the level of intensification that we would expect to occur naturally in the city of Hamilton without any kind of substantial policy intervention or land supply constraints on the greenfield side, which we'll talk about a little. The current trends forecast, although it looks to be about the same, it, well, it is about the same in terms of the share of growth, um, is not a straight line approach. The current trends maintains the upward trajectory of growth, maintains Hamilton's emergence as a significant centre within the metropolitan area and actually represents a significant amount of new development. The high forecast at 48% of units is not 
I wouldn't say that we've pushed it totally over the top, but from a market perspective, getting 48%, close to 50% is definitely what we would consider to be a stretch goal from a policy perspective. It's definitely at the high end of the range. And just to give you a sense of what that means in terms of development activity, using apartment buildings just as an example, depending on the forecast scenario, we're running between about 20,000 and 35,000 high-rise apartment units over the period to 2041. So if we take your average, say, 200-unit apartment building in the city of Hamilton, that means four to 10 new apartment buildings under construction each year, every year, starting in 2016 to 2041. So although the share of units in intensification might look like it's consistent with historic trends, it's, being, it's going to be applied to a much larger base because also recall back to some of the work that was done on the employment lands and the employment area update. The growth plan forecast for Hamilton anticipates broadly a much larger economic and demographic role for the city over time and we're, we're watching it happen. So growth plan is definitely at the high end of the range. It represents a significant amount of new development activity both in terms of high rise apartments and other ground related forms which not only can be part of the mix, but are going to have to be part of the mix in order to achieve the target, particularly on the row houses because they're attractive starter homes. Because the high forecast really just sort of gets you to the growth plan target, what we're calling this 50% is a suitable aspirational target. It's a high target, it represents significant additional development and when you read the growth plan, um, I think many people get this sense that as long as you just have the right policies in place, the intensification will happen. The Schedule 3 forecast will be achieved. As long as you just have the right words on a piece of paper, uh, you'll get more intensification. And it's more complex than that. Because of the forces that are driving intensification, in order to actually achieve more intensification, demand needs to change. So the success that the city has in attracting accommodation has to do with its relative attraction within the metro area as a location for investment. When you think about your traditional sort of ground-related, road-oriented, suburban development, you know, that is sort of consistent. That's why developers have model homes. You can pick from one of three types. They, they tend to be relatively consistent over large areas. From an intensification perspective, consumers have options. There's downtown Toronto. There's the Vaughan Metropolitan Center, there's a subway to downtown, there's Kitchener-Waterloo, there's Hamilton. So although there is this sense, I would say, in the growth plan that intensification and greenfield are sort of presumed to be interchangeable, they're not. They're really driven by fundamentally different dynamics. The amount of intensification that's accommodated has to do with Hamilton's attraction as a location for development. The amount of greenfield housing that you accommodate really has to do with the supply available to accommodate that demand. From a demand perspective on intensification, in addition to these broad economic and demographic forces, there are also some supply considerations. There has to be a viable supply option. There has to be a landowner that wants to undertake the development. There have to be services in place. There has to be job opportunities. There has to be infrastructure in place, transit in particular. And there also has to be a planning framework that intentionally encourages intensification, in this case within the built up area. And Hamilton is very well advanced. The, the planning regulation is required to set the density framework to encourage intensification to happen, but also to just manage the process of development over time. We don't have to look very far to the city of Toronto to see what some of the challenges are associated with huge demand for condo development. And so the city is very well advanced on updated policy and zoning frameworks to set the framework to accommodate intensification. We have the nodes and corridor structure that Joanne talked about. We have a new downtown secondary plan. We have in force and in progress guidance on transit oriented development. We have new residential zoning bylaws, a number of secondary plans. We have plans for the West Harbor, um, which is an incredible success story. The fact that we have that level of interest for that number of units in the city of Hamilton is a real testament to the resurgence of the city. We have incentive programs in place to encourage development as well. I understand that there has been some discussion here about potentially reducing the incentive programs over time. And we do know anecdotally a lot of apartment units under construction at the moment, but the pricing has started to come up. I mean, it started around 400 bucks a foot. It's up around 500, 600. Some of the new projects we understand are somewhere around $600 a foot. That is starting to get pretty close to the pricing for new condo development in sort of the western parts of the GTA in Oakville. So 
A discussion about incentives is probably ongoing. They probably need to be part of the picture for the time being. I wouldn't suggest abandoning them uh, immediately. Not so much because they're required to encourage intensification. They're not going to motivate a landowner to build something in Hamilton versus Kitchener-Waterloo, for example. But if it came to that, it would certainly break a tie. So in addition to the incentive programs, we also have things like the laneway housing pilot program, which I see as part of this broader discussion of the missing middle, which some of you might have heard about, the missing middle in housing and ways to address affordability. Because on the one hand, we have these huge residential towers, and on the other, we have these sort of traditional suburban developments and, and not much in between. So we have initiatives for that. And of course, we have transit investments, which we know are a huge influence on intensification, both regionally in terms of the GO Transit network and locally in terms of the LRT. So the planning framework is very well advanced and the growth outlook to make a long story short is extremely positive. So um, could Hamilton plan for a higher intensification target? Could it plan for greater than 50%? Yes, uh, that is certainly the option. However, uh, it is an option. Uh, I would reiterate though from a market perspective, which is separate from planning objectives, from a market perspective, we would view a target of 50% really as being at the absolute high end of the range of plausible market outlook. So I would view that 50% as a stretch goal. And it might not seem like a lot of units based on the historic rate, but it's going to be being applied to a much larger number of units. It's going to be a significant, um, a significant amount of development. So the act of setting the intensification target higher than 50%, there's no guarantee that that's going to achieve more intensification. It might when combined with a number of other factors, but there is a risk that you won't get those units. Just setting the target in and of itself is not going to achieve higher intensification. What it will do, absolutely certainly, is it will, because this is the way the land need assessment is structured, it will reduce the pool of units that are available to be allocated to the greenfield area, because with the way the land need assessment is currently structured, we have a total housing unit forecast, which at this point is roughly 93,000 units to 2041. 50% intensification, those units just come straight off the top and you have a remainder that's allocated to the greenfield area. If you set the target higher and the target is not achieved, there is a risk of a mismatch between the supply of land that's designated for family sized units or family oriented housing uh, and the supply of available units for that versus the supply of units for non-family demand which is going to be intensification inside the built boundary for young adults doing what they've been doing for a very long time. It's an established demographic pattern. Yes, there are opportunities to utilize existing infrastructure and there are bits of underused infrastructure, but to make a long story very short, all you have to do is look at the City of Toronto experience and you can, you can observe that you use those bits up a lot faster than you think. And it is a complex arrangement. Really, you save on the linear-based services by concentrating density, but all of the people-oriented services still need to be provided. It generates additional costs. It tends to be more expensive. So an important principle about intensification, again, back to the broad forces that are driving demand, just yes, the city can choose a higher target, but from a market perspective, it is absolutely at the high end of the range within a broader metropolitan context because it's not the only game in town. And you've noted, might have noticed that other people are performing very well and it is a competitive environment. And there is a risk that the population forecast is not achieved, which could create some fiscal and service delivery impacts if the growth-related costs are not covered by growth-related revenue. So there's, there, what the evidence is showing is that um, People continue to seek out affordable ground-related housing units. People are still driving for affordability. It's been that way for as long as I've been practicing. And recently, we've seen an emerging pattern of much more rapid growth in smaller communities within the extended commuter shed of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Oxford County, Hastings County, Brantford, Brant, Niagara. And so people are literally continuing to trade travel time and commuting distance for affordable ground-related housing. So yes, the target can be set higher. But there are risks that the growth simply won't be achieved and you could be into some, some fiscal challenges in terms of financing growth. Which leads us to the other side of the coin, as it were, on the residential, which is the designated greenfield area. And that is exactly what it seems. It's the designated area outside the built boundary that includes the city's existing 
Greenfield area, which are the areas shown in white, and the new areas which are shown in blue. And of course, the amount of the blue area that winds up on that map and the location of the blue area is part of the more detailed work that we're going to be carrying out as GRIDS2 and MCR proceeds. It's also important to point out, as uh, both Heather and Joanne had touched on, intensification that occurs within the designated greenfield area is still intensification and it's still good planning from a planning perspective, but it doesn't count as intensification within the built boundary and it takes away from the pool of units that would otherwise go down there, which is a challenge for getting to the number. And this is going to come up in the density discussion that we're going to have in a bit. And a very good example of how this might happen is the emerging trend of the redevelopment of these big, large format retail malls for mixed use development. We're seeing it in Toronto around Yorkville, we're seeing it in Southern York region around Vaughan Mills. And from an intensification perspective, this type of thing is rare. I mean, usually it's an incremental process, it goes site by site, building by building, the servicing is provided. You don't often see these large master plan communities, but to the extent that we have large, older, large format retail malls within the existing DGA, you could be talking about a lot of units. At the upper end, they're talking 1,500 units at Yorkdale. I think they're talking over 4,000 units at Vaughan Mills. So these are, you know, potentially game-changing intensification activity that's not happening in the built boundary. Uh, the growth plan sets a target of 50 residents and jobs per hectare. The calculation itself is fairly straightforward. Uh, it's the number of people living in the area plus the jobs divided by the land area gets you the density. There's some more detailed analysis that has to go into determining those three inputs, but fundamentally it's a straightforward calculation. It excludes employment lands, uh, which is a change from a previous growth plan and a good one because the original greenfield density target included employment areas and it was just very difficult to apply on a regional basis because you have some municipalities with very large supplies of relatively low density employment lands, like say in Southern York region and those that don't. So the places that had the large supply of low density lands had to really amp up the density on the residential side to make the 50. So they changed that to exclude employment areas, which is treated a bit separately. And we'll talk about that. And it applies to the city's existing uh, designated area as well as new, which is another change from previous growth plans. Uh, the most recent one that has just been changed had slightly different targets for each one. The current greenfield area in the city of Hamilton is estimated to be 56 residents and jobs per hectare, and that is um, an estimate based on the currently planned lands. Most of the greenfield area is planned, so we know what the, from a development perspective, what the expected unit counts are, and we can apply PPUs and make estimates for jobs. There's a small amount that we make estimates for at the edge, but overall, it's 56 people and jobs per hectare, which is above the growth plan target of 50, uh, but not by much. Newer areas, especially fruit land, and the target that's in the official plan is, is higher. It's 70 residents and jobs per hectare. So um, just to give you a bit of context, in the region of Peel, which includes uh, Brampton, Caledon, small parts of Mississauga, the overall residential density is 65 residents and jobs per hectare. So that's higher than we're seeing for the existing designated area in Hamilton, slightly lower than we're planning for Fruitland and other new areas under the official plan. There are some subdivisions in Milton. I think the Trafalgar area in Milton is at around 62 or 63. They have some higher, some lower, but really what the market is delivering in new residential communities looks to be coming in sort of like roughly at the 60 to 65 residents and jobs per hectare. And we've shown some examples at the bottom of the screen uh, ranging from sort of higher to lower to your left are, are more of the sort of semi-detached row house stack towns which would be closer to the 70 and then down on this end we have sort of the more traditional ground related detached dwelling which would be closer to the 50. Just a couple of examples in Hamilton to show you what it looks like on the ground. This is in Dundas. It's a more mature community, Highland Hills East, which is estimated at 62 persons and jobs per hectare. You can see from the map that it's comprised of, uh, you know, a traditional family-oriented neighborhood, which is probably somewhere in the 50 residents and jobs per hectare range. And then we have a large institutional and higher density residential use on the other side, which I understand to be a retirement residence. So this is an example of something that would be sort of in range with the densities we're seeing across the metropolitan area. And then we have a newer area in Upper Stony Creek, the Ropa Nine lands, 
which are currently developing it just under the growth plan target. So these, again, are traditional family-oriented housing, some rows, some employment opportunities, but just sort of a little bit below. When the rest of the area builds out and it matures, I would expect it to, on an area-wide basis, probably be closer to the growth plan target overall. So although both the intensification target and the greenfield density target are sort of characterized as minimums in the growth plan, I would view the intensification target as 50% as being sort of very high on the range of plausible market demand. The greenfield density target, I would say, is sort of much more appropriately discussed as a minimum because we know that the market in some of the big communities that are close to Hamilton and getting closer by the day are sort of in that 60 to 65 residents and jobs per hectare. So if you plan for a higher greenfield target, you're using up less land, the density is higher, you have a higher population density, there's opportunities to plan for transit, so there are a number of positive planning implications. Once you start getting up into the 70, the 75, the 80 residents and jobs per hectare, then you start to encounter a similar problem that you're having with intensification, which is you start, you start having to plan for a shift in the housing mix towards those medium and higher density forms, which are row houses and apartments. To make 80, for example, you have to have a huge amount of townhouses. You have to have greenfield apartment units, which is going to compete with demand that you want to accommodate inside the built boundary. So again, intensification and greenfield, they're different dynamics. They're driven by different things. They're not interchangeable. And at the end of the day, it's going to be a judgment on how far you want to push it to achieve good planning principles without pushing the market to another location. So just quickly, and I'm repeating this point because it's, it, it's important to understand that intensification in green fields really are driven by fundamentally different dynamics from a planning perspective. Intensification is all about demand. It's about the number of people that want to live in a high-rise development in the city of Hamilton, given that they can choose. They can go to Toronto, they can go to KW, they can go to other emerging centres. It's about the city's relative attraction for development. And the city can and has been and continues to upgrade and update the planning policy and regulatory framework to encourage intensification, but at the end of the day, the city in itself cannot control the market. So if the objective is to achieve higher rates of intensification, it's much more about doing all those other things that make the city an attractive place for investment than simply setting a higher intensification target. And that's economic developments, it's investment attraction, it's the port, it's the bayfront, it's West Harbor, it's arts and culture, it's restaurants, it's, it's all of these high urban amenity, it's transit investment, it's all of these things that make people want to live in a highly urbanized environment in the city of Hamilton. And so at the end of the day, again, it's a judgment, it's a balance between the two, and it's going to be at the end of the day a question of how far we feel we can push it in the spirit of the growth plan without causing unanticipated consequences. And this, again, is part of the more detailed work that we're going to be carrying out as part of GRIDS 2 and the MCR on population growth, the housing mix, and employment, which is the last piece of the land needs assessment uh, triangle that we saw earlier. Uh, and the question really is about how much land is required to accommodate employment growth. And basically, and you've heard me say this before, largely comes down to this notion of employment areas and what kind of employment area lands are required to accommodate growth. <laughs> Stepping back a little bit, it's important or helpful, I would say, to consider employment in terms of the major land use types. And many of you might have heard me discuss this before. We have put aside rural employment for the moment. We have major office employment, which are jobs in the large office buildings. We have population-related employment, which is employment that exists in response to a resident population, healthcare, government, commercial, retail, work at home. And then we have what's called employment land employment, which is the wide range of jobs that are accommodated predominantly in industrial type form. So employment areas are mostly industrial type development. They're areas designated in the plan to accommodate uh, mainly industrial type buildings, mainly employment land, but they also accommodate population related employment. You've seen coffee shops and Tim's in employment areas, some of the furniture outlets. Um, and in some cases, we have major office employment on the greenfield employment line as well. So it's uh, 
a bit of a finicky distinction from a land economics perspective, the employment by type, but the employment areas. Uh, what we do know on a preliminary basis is that currently the urban employment areas in Hamilton account for roughly a third of the total employment, so they play a huge role in the economic base, and that's generally expected to continue over time. And um, it will include both the existing areas, especially some of the specialized economic infrastructure that you have at the port, which plays a huge, and I can't believe not going to be a growing role over time. It's a part of manufacturing, it's a part of the steel industry, plays a huge role in the agri-food industry. And of course we have the future of Bayfront, which is currently under review. So the existing areas are incredibly important, and the new areas as well, which are likely to be the location of most of the new growth, and in particular we're talking about new areas in Red Hill and those around the airport that Joanne talked a little bit about earlier. And to make a long story short, the reason that we have this preliminary view on employment land and the demand for employment areas is because, as you probably know, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the broader metro region, continues to be one of the fastest growing economic zones and metropolitan regions in Canada and the United States. And it's not just any jobs. We have this something, what's happening in the tech sector is absolutely incredible. It is just a surge in high skill, higher wage jobs. We have automation, we have artificial intelligence, which are affecting all types of sector in Toronto. Broadly, the metro region is accommodating all of those jobs. There is absolutely no evidence, not that I've seen, that the currently high levels of demand for employment land are going to change rapidly or significantly. Three big things in play. E-commerce, which shows no signs of stopping in terms of its demand for warehouse space across the board. Not just the giant fulfillment centers, not like 1.2, 1.3 million square foot facilities in a greenfield business park, but also smaller distribution facilities to address some of the challenges with delivery. Also, although when we think of employment land, we talk about industrial type buildings and we talk about employment areas accommodating mainly industrial type buildings from a foreign perspective, most of the jobs in employment areas, and this is shown clearly in the city's employment survey, most of the jobs in the employment areas are not in the goods producing sectors as we understand it. You look broadly, even in the city of Toronto, which has a lot of very old employment areas, employment areas accommodate a huge amount of the professional service type employment, which the high skilled jobs, the tech jobs, that we expect to grow very rapidly over the forecast period. We're also quite bullish on manufacturing. Um, part of the manufacturing story that I don't think is told enough is that really the train left the station 15 years ago on a global goods production scale when it comes to low scale manufacturing. It's all advanced manufacturing. All the new stuff is advanced manufacturing. There is no new, very little new manufacturing is remedial manufacturing. It's all advanced, it's all high tech, it's all automated. And in our view, there are going to be huge opportunities for manufacturing and it's going to go in the most competitive spots, which includes established employment concentrations in the metro region as well as the city of Hamilton because of its location relative to the trade corridors and a growing proximity to the city of Toronto and to the broader metro region from a market perspective. So maintaining an appropriate and marketable supply of land is important there. And again, that's part of the work that we're going to be uh, carrying out as we go forward with Grids2 and the MCR. And just as a final comment before I hand it back to Heather, we are waiting for some changes on the land need assessment. There is some uncertainty about where it's going to land. There's a lot of talk about introducing more of a market-based uh, lens to especially the housing because one of the things that I find very interesting about the way this land needs assessment is structured is that it's really only on the residential side where the policy influence is being directed. It is much about more compact, more transit supportive, higher density forms, changing the way people live, moving around family size units so it's not just your traditional greenfield environment. It can be laneway housing, it can be other parts of the missing middle, it can be larger family size apartments. The economics on the employment side are much more market based and in my view it recognizes the importance of economic development to the community, the difficulty in changing it through planning policy and you know really this need to balance the economy and the environment and the community like the growth plan does which is encapsulated in this notion of complete communities but also in the original grids, the triple bottom line approach is we're going to be taking it forward as I understand in next stages. So with that, I will hand it back to Heather to talk a little bit about where we go from here. Thank, Thank you, you, Anthony. Heather, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And I didn't mention when I introduced Anthony, but Anthony will be also, um, has been retained to 
uh, help the city with our land needs assessment as well, the completion of that study, and that's why we did ask him to speak to the density and the employment side as well, because he is familiar uh, with those areas of the city as well. So going back to this side, which uh, I'd shown at the beginning, we're going to move on now to a dis discussion of how those targets that we just talked about can work together to influence overall land need in the city. So if you recall, the, the land needs assessment or the LNA will use information on intensification, so the appropriate target, and greenfield density, and employment information to determine how much additional land needs the city may require to accommodate our future growth. We're going to focus primarily today on the residential side and the intensification and the, the greenfield target. So the graphic on the side shows or illustrates this point in a fairly simple manner. So at the top you can see if the targets are increased, the overall required additional land area would decrease. So that is if you accommodate more of your city's growth of the anticipated growth through intensification within the existing built up area and we develop our greenfield areas at a higher density, the resulting need for future urban expansion area would be lower. And of course, the opposite is true, which you can see on the bottom of the side. If the targets are decreased, the overall land need would increase. So how do we determine the appropriate targets then for Hamilton? We know the targets in the growth plan are minimums, as Anthony had just gone through. And we know the city can consider different targets that are appropriate for the city. However, we also know there's limitation on the targets that can be considered due to market demand, existing approvals, and current patterns of development, which we need to consider. So we're just going to touch on those briefly right now. So starting on the intensification side and looking at alternative targets on that side, again, we know the growth plan minimum is 50%. We know preliminary findings that Anthony has reported on identify 50% as a suitable aspirational target for the city on the market demand side, and that that is actually fairly, pretty much a stretch goal for the city to achieve because it is at the high end of the forecast. So can the city consider a higher or lower intensification target? Yes, definitely, but we must be aware of some limitations. So on the lower side, the city may request a lower target, but this would, uh, this, there is a risk to this request uh, as it may not be approved by the minister in light of significant opportunities for intensification, intensification in our downtown, along our LRT corridor, and considering significant, significant provincial investment in the LRT project. So there's a risk involved in applying for that alternative target. Can the city plan for a higher target? Yes. As we just heard, the growth plan minimum of 50% is already at the high end of the forecast demand range. That's what our preliminary findings tell us. So there would be a risk to planning for a higher target. Uh, if the demand for intensification units does not materialize, the city may not meet its overall growth forecasts, and that would cause related fiscal impacts. There are also existing approvals in the city's existing greenfield lands to consider. We had that map before that showed our existing designated greenfield areas that are already within our urban boundary. And within those lands, we already have a number of units approved for development through subdivision or site plan or planned for development through secondary planning. And those units account for approximately 20% of the city's overall future uh, anticipated unit growth to 2041. So really the highest target, if we want to continue and, and allow those units to develop, the highest intensification target we would consider would be about 80%, taking those already planned units into account. And so 80% would really equate to a no urban boundary expansion option for the city. And moving to the designated greenfield area, it's helpful in this case to break it down between considering the target for our existing greenfield lands that are already in our urban boundary, and then any new lands which may be added to the urban boundary if it's deemed to be required. So again, the growth plan minimum greenfield density target is 50 persons and jobs, and we know, as Anthony pointed out, that our existing plan density is 56 persons and jobs per hectare, so we're already beyond the, the minimum target. We also know that most of our existing greenfield areas are already planned. Of the approximately 4,200 gross hectares of greenfield lands, only about 118 hectares remains unplanned. So there's very limited opportunity to really increase that density target on our existing greenfield lands. So we have to be aware of that going forward. So then if we look at a potential density target for any new lands that are added to our urban boundary, we know again that the minimum is 50 persons and jobs because that's measured across the board on our existing and our new lands. And we know that the city already has targets for a higher density in place at 70 persons and jobs, and that our newest communities are planned at a higher target. 
So can the city consider a higher or lower target for these lands? Yes, definitely, but similar, when we look at a lower target, we note that the request for a lower target would carry risk of not being approved by the minister. It does require provincial approval, particularly in light of the fact that we're already exceeding the minimum target in our existing area. Can the city plan for a higher target? Definitely, yes. I uh, just want to be aware, though, that the higher the target mean, would mean the higher the share of townhouses and multiple dwellings, possibly competing with intensification units and not adequately supplying the low-density market. So the question becomes, how high do we want to plan for? And then this is just uh, a slide, really, just to visually sum up the two targets, really. You can almost think of them as dials, and each, um, each dial can be moved up or down on the intensification side or the density side. They can be moved together or separately and doing so will result in different overall land area requirements. And then finally, on this note, just wanted to put together a little uh, diagram that shows uh, some different possible scenarios that could be considered when we look at the targets and the combination of those targets. The graphic on the screen shows three possible scenarios, but really the possibilities are endless. There's multiple combinations of targets that we could consider. The, uh, the low target scenario that we've identified on the top would keep intensification at about 50%. This is really a growth plan minimum scenario. would have our density in our greenfield areas at 50 persons and jobs per hectare. And you can see that out of these three scenarios, that would result in the largest overall uh, urban expansion area being required. It would be considered more of a mid-range or current development scenario. We would have our intensification. We've kept that at 50% because that is what we achieved last year and a greenfield density at about 60 persons and jobs. And in this scenario, the urban expansion area, if required, would be more moderate. And at the high end scenario, with intensification, if we theoretically increased it to 60 and had a greenfield density at 70 persons and jobs, expansion area, if required, could be minimal. Again, these are theoretical. We haven't worked through any of the numbers, just to try to illustrate how the different targets as they work together can have an impact on overall land need. But, and this is an important point, and we don't want to lose sight of it, is that urban expansion area and required land need is only one potential impact as we work through these considerations of targets. All scenarios will also have an impact on servicing and infrastructure requirements, housing distribution and housing mix, transportation and transit, overall growth potential for the city, climate change considerations, impact on our agriculture and rural areas, and city revenues and financial impacts. So we don't want to lose sight of all of these other considerations as we look at, at the targets. And we want to make sure that we understand that it's not just about future expansion area land need, it's a bigger picture consideration. So just finally, a few takeaways that we've preliminarily identified from some of these, uh, these uh, discussions that we've been having. The minimum targets are not necessarily the right target for the city on the intensification side. The preliminary findings of the RI demand study has found that <clears throat> the growth plan minimum of 50% is a suitable aspirational target, though it will be a challenge to reach. On the greenfield density side, the city is already achieving densities higher than the minimum, and generally, as Anthony had noted, new urban areas are already developing at densities higher than that growth plan minimum. We need to balance the need for a variety of housing types and market demand with other objectives transit supportive communities, complete communities, preserving agricultural land. Uh, we need to be aware that increasing both the intensification target and the density target could lead to a planned future housing mix being overly comprised of medium and high density housing forms and under comprised of single detached dwellings. If Hamilton doesn't supply the demand for low density housing, that growth could go elsewhere. The city may not meet its growth targets, which creates financial implications if anticipated revenues are lower than expected. And finally, planning for a higher target does not mean that the city will actually achieve that target. Growth and development is dictated by a combination of broad market forces and Hamilton's relative location and attraction for investment. Now, switching gears, we're just, I know it's been a long presentation, we're just going to very quickly highlight what would be the next phase of the MCR. Uh, after we've completed the land needs assessment, this would be phase four of the study. So if the land needs assessment identifies a need for additional land to accommodate the city's growth to 2041, the next phase would be the evaluation of growth options. So we would know how much land is required, then the question would be where. Where should that land occur in, in a phasing or timing consideration as well? But we know there's a number of limitations on where the city can or can't grow. So we know expansion into the Greenbelt Plan area is prohibited. 
There's a small exception to this rule for what, what are considered towns within the Greenbelt Plan, and in Hamilton, that's water down in Binbrook. So they can have a 10 hectare expansion into the Greenbelt Plan area, so it's very small in the relative scheme of things. But elsewhere throughout the city, expansion into the Greenbelt Plan is prohibited, and we can only consider what we call our white belt lands, which we'll show in a moment. Uh, there's no residential development permitted above the 28 NEF contour around the airport. There is certainly agricultural and natural heritage considerations to take into account. And there's previous council direction from the first grids, as Joanne identified, which had identified Al Friday as the preferred growth area to 2031, with a motion to include the 20 road east lands in the next comprehensive review. And the minutes of settlement from the AGD hearing, again, as Joanne had mentioned, which had identified an east to west progression of future growth areas for the city. So these are previous council directions that we certainly have to be aware of as we go forward. So this is a map which just shows uh, the city's white belt lands that I mentioned previously. So the white belt lands are, they're color coded on here in either pink, yellow, or blue. The white belt means that they are within our rural area, but they're not part of the green belt. So they are areas where the city could consider a future expansion if it's deemed uh, required. So this slide identifies primarily the three of our largest uh, white belt areas. So on the right, we have the Alfreda growth area, which is approximately 1,200 hectares gross area. So that's not including any uh, constraints. That area is identified as pink as potentially accommodating residential development to 2031 or beyond. In the middle, we have the 20 road east lands, as we call them, which is about 380 gross hectares, and again, could accommodate residential growth in the future, being outside of that 28 contour, the airport contour is shown in purple. And then we have 20 road west lands and the Garner Road land, that's this area on the left of your screen. These areas are identified as accommodating residential or employment to 2031 or beyond. The area in blue is uh, constrained by the NEF contours, so that those lands would be um, available for employment growth in the future. So going forward then, once the land use assessment is completed and we know what, what uh, our required land area may be, we will be developing an evaluation framework with input from stakeholders and the public, which will respond to the criteria in the growth plan, the city's nine directions with updates as needed. We'll use a climate change lens going forward, as well as other important considerations such as fiscal impacts and a number of, uh, a wide variety of uh, considerations that we'll be um, taking into account. And I think just to sum up on this point, what I think is important to remember is that uh, growth is not good or bad. It's how we respond to that growth that's good or bad. And so a thorough and comprehensive evaluation framework will be key going forward. And finally, Joanne had uh, shown this slide at the beginning. Uh, we are uh, here at the council workshop phase. We do have some public consultation planned for the end of November and early December, which I'll show you those dates in the next slide. And then there's other multiple opportunities for public engagement as we go through the process and coming back before committee for decisions in the future. As I noted, we do have consultation events planned for end of November and early December. We'll be discussing a lot of the same material that we talked about here, asking for uh, the public's uh, input on intensification and density considerations, uh, also some employment land review. Um, we've chosen a wide variety of locations across the city and at different times to try to be accommodating. We're trying to get the word out about the importance of this project uh, with web updates, open houses, we're looking at other options, uh, billboards, pop-up events as needed to really try to spread the word wide. We've just recently sent a newsletter out to our mailing list, letting them know about the upcoming events. So we're trying our best to get the word out. And just finally to conclude, just some key decision points that we upcoming for council to keep in mind. We are aiming for February of this year to come back to you to discuss intensification and density and, and the land needs assessment. This could be impacted if the province does decide to amend the land needs assessment methodology. We would have to look at these dates, but as of right now, this is a timeline. And then as Joanne mentioned, looking at the end of the year, next year uh, to identify preferred growth option. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening. I know it was lengthy. Take um, a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> and Joanne and Anthony and I will be available for questions. We are going to go sit at the... Uh, yeah, so if, if you three would like to make your way to the front row, and uh, I do have a list of speakers. I have uh, several questions for you. We'll just give you a couple of minutes if you make your way. While you're doing that, I'm going to start with Councillor Brad Clark, please. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, it was an excellent presentation, very comprehensive. I not only enjoyed it, but I learned a lot of new things that I wasn't unaware of, and I was very pleased to see in the presentation. So uh, I'm glad we did this. So thank you, Mr. Thorne, and to all of your staff. So, so some quick questions then. The density targets seem to have shifted between governments. So it was 40%, then it was 50%, then it went to 60%, and now we're back down to 40%, I think. Where are we now? Okay, who would like to Maybe answer? Maybe it's 40% in the urban built-up area and 50% in the designated green area. Uh, through the chair, you're correct. They have been shifting, and sometimes it's hard to uh, keep, keep track. The previous target under the 2006 growth plan for intensification was 40%. Mm -hmm. We are now at 50%. And on the greenfield density side, we are at 50 persons and jobs per hectare, and both are existing in our new greenfield areas. And all of the changes in Bill 108, will that affect the 50%? Will it be lower than 50, or are we confident that the 50% is going to be the target? Heather? Uh, through the chair, we don't anticipate any additional changes to those targets. That's good to know. Uh, for now, yeah, I know. <laughs> Everything is different, right? Um, we haven't been hitting the growth targets for intensification in the downtown area. Um, we've been averaging about 30%. Is there a penalty or implications of not hitting these targets? Heather? Uh, through the chair, no. Not that I'm, none of them I'm aware of. There's no uh, penalty. They are targets that we must plan to achieve. So I'm not aware of any penalty from the province if we don't. It's just more of, if the city doesn't achieve our overall growth forecast, certainly there could be financial implications for the city on our end because it affects our overall planning. Which will be over to Mr. Zagarek. I'm coming to him in a minute. Um, with regards to the provincial growth plan numbers, I'm being diplomatic. They have not been that accurate in the past. Are we confident, perhaps this question would be better suited for Anthony, are we confident that those growth projection numbers that they are uh, enunciating are, are reasonable? I don't want to say accurate, but we haven't come close in the past, so are they, they reasonable? Anthony? Uh, thank you. Yes, the short, answer is, the short answer is yes, and for the time being at least, uh, from a legislative perspective, the forecasts that are currently in the growth plan are the forecasts that must be used for long-range planning and growth management. So uh, this arose at length in the, in the hearing around the airport a number of years back, and um, it's a very interesting discussion about factors which might increase or lower the forecast, but for the time being, from a planning perspective, these are the forecasts that, that must be used. Now, with that said, if you look back historically, 2006, 2011, the forecasts were all very close. Uh, where the differences mostly have arisen is in the 2011 to the 2016 period, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, without getting into a technical discussion, there were some problems with the 2011 base. It was slightly uh, understated, and there were some problems with the NHS, which replaced the census in 2011 in terms of the underreporting of employment. So there were some problems with the base, and the growth plan forecasts that are currently in Schedule 3 were prepared before the census was released. So they were in part based on estimates that would take everything to a 2016 base. Um, the but other- so, so at the end of the day, the objections and challenges that Mississauga and Peel had to the growth projections had no impact on the actual growth projection. We still have to meet those projections. They still have to be used for planning, for long-range planning and growth management. It is important to point the one thing that the growth plan forecast did not anticipate over the 2011 to 2016 period was the net out migration to um, Western provinces uh, related to the upswing in, in, in the oil patch. Mm. And as we know, um, unfortunately, that has rather gone the other way for them right now, and immigration patterns have returned uh, to more historic norms. And if you look at the historic population growth in Ontario since 2016, the post-2016 pattern has shown a, a much different pattern. The, the return of migration from the oil patch combined with changes to the federal immigration limits uh, has created huge growth in population in Ontario for 2016, 2017. 2018, 2019 is probably going to be even higher, but 2018 was the highest absolute amount of population growth in the province of Ontario that has ever been seen. Thank you. Uh, Councillor? Um, so if I may, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, switching now to Appendix F, which is page 19 of 21 on the handout that was provided to us. Um, it, it deals with um, prime agricultural lands not being used uh, for 
or development is what the province tries to get us to do. But in this particular report on page 20 of 21, it looks like that has been removed. An assessment of agriculture capability considers directing urban growth onto these lands which are not or at lower priorities, and then it talks about the lands that do not comprise specialty crops. There are reasonable, or there are no reasonable alternatives. The municipalities can, in essence, use that prime agricultural land. So this document is this. Are these proposed changes, or are these changes that have already occurred in these policies within the city? Heather, Joanne. Through you, Madam Chair, these policies that you see here, they're divided into two. I'm just, and I'm going to give you a background context for a second. We have 2.1 and 2.2, and then 2.3 is the airport. Mm -hmm. The airport policies were, as part of this, uh, the OMB hearing at Correct. that time, settled everything in 2.3 with the exception of, I believe, uh, the last one, 2.33. 2.1 and 2.2 are part of the Al-Frida um, Al appeal. So specifically 2.2.3 D. Heather? Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, what is before you is the black is the version of the UHOP in 2011 or 12, I guess, modified by the province. So in D, you're going to see at the very back end, mod 4C. Yes. That was a modification made by the province. Anything where it says a mod, that means it was a modified in the, in the highlights and the strikeouts or provincial changes. And, and this is important because in the past, the argument has made that prime agricultural lands not be utilized for development. What this is saying from the province, not from the municipality, um, and correct me if I'm misreading this, prime agricultural lands that do not comprise speci specialty crops and there are no reasonable alternatives that can avoid prime agriculture areas and there are no reasonable alternatives on lower prime agricultural lands. So if there's no lower prime agricultural lands available, lower quality, that can be utilized for the growth then the province is saying the municipality may utilize prime agricultural land. Is that a correct interpretation of that clause? Joanne, is that accurate? Uh, three, it is. Thank you. And so given that, and given the changes that we're experiencing through the climate change and trying to lower greenhouse gases, should we, as a municipality, try to be more conservative with our plans when we're developing prime agricultural lands, or at the very least, trying to preserve some of them, or trying to come up with a mitigation to the development of that prime agricultural lands. So for example, in Al Frida, there's a significant portion of prime agricultural lands that are under uh, um, assessment for development. If we're taking that out of the food crop land, should we not be developing policies that would encourage food crop production on other lower quality agricultural lands, perhaps through the use of greenhouses. Joanne. Um, through you, Madam Chairman, I think it's really important that the Rural Hamilton official plan is very, very strong on rural lands. And we always say it's right to farm and agricultural first. So at the end of the day, our rural lands are also very strong because we try to promote them equally. Now on rural lands, you can have a few more uses than you do on agricultural lands. But I think it's important to note that, for example, as Councillor Clark's talked about greenhouses, greenhouses, yes, on rural lands would be certainly appropriate, but they are also allowed on prime agricultural lands. And you, do they have a smaller footprint um, overall and they might yield more crop production? Perhaps, but I just wanted to point out that our rural lands are equally important to uh, this discussion as well. Councillor? And, and I'm not disputing that. I'm trying to I'm not opposed to development. We need development or we're in, as a municipality, we can't grow. It's that simple. But taking up all the prime agriculture land in the, in, in the Alfreda area without ensuring that we're somehow mitigating it with other food production lands available in Upper Stony Creek, perhaps, then we may be failing ourselves given that we're gonna have real challenges with food production in the future because of climate change and 
because of the cost of fuels and the transportation. So many municipalities across North America are trying to improve local food production. Should we not be looking at an offset? If we're going to use this land for development, and I say if, I don't know how much, should we not be looking at other areas and encouraging other areas for food production locally? Would that not be an appropriate mitigation to this development? For you, Madam Chairman, yes, that would be one way we could look at it. One of the things as part of El Frida, we are looking at the agricultural lands in the El Frida or any other area to see what's actually going on there. What do they contribute to the local economy? Are they cash cropping? Are they fallow? What are they? I think that's also a very important assessment because there's also mitigation when you put an urban boundary against an agricultural area. And that the province is also recognized as an important evaluation as well. Councillor? Uh, absolutely. Um, but to be fair, ever since we've designated the El Frida area as where the development is going to go, most of the farmers have sold their property to developers for development. So it's all cash crops now. So what was happening 10, 15, 20 years ago is not what's happening today. Um, the other question I have with regards to the development in El Frida is are we going to be looking at a comprehensive transportation infrastructure study? When I'm looking at the El Frida area and I see Glover Road, Trinity Church, Fletcher, Regional 56, I see First, Second, Aldershot Golf Club, I see Highland and Mud Street. So we're talking 130,000 residents in that area between now and 2041 and we have not yet assessed the transportation corridors that would be handling that. And when I look at what transpired in Summit Park, we built Summit Park, and then we are now trying to catch up with the widening of Rymel Road and, and Upper Red Hill Valley Parkway was just opened in the last term. So will there be a comprehensive transportation study done for that area so that we can assess exactly what changes have to happen to all of those rural roads, um, residential roads, and some would be switched to collector roads. Steve? Uh, so through the chair, uh, yes. Uh, from a transportation perspective, uh, once we have the, the allocation of population and employment, then we would uh, input that into our transportation modeling to uh, create outputs and understand what the potential impacts would be. Councillor? So that would be a comprehensive transportation infrastructure study for El Frida before we finalize moving forward. We need to know those costs moving forward, obviously. Steve? Uh, so through the chair, as part of the secondary plan for El Frida, a transportation study is being undertaken. Um, as part of um, grids two, we would be looking for a transportation evaluation of all the potential growth scenarios. I guess that's one of my challenges and I'll take it up with my colleagues because we're doing it backwards again. We're going to approve the subdivisions and then we're going to say, okay, now where do we need to widen the roads? Whereas we should be having the infrastructure in place in advance so we understand what has to happen and then proceed with the development. Mr. Mr. DeSantis and all those developers who developed in Summit Park should not have been put in a position where their residents were moving in, and then the city didn't have the transportation infrastructure and that was required to actually service those communities, and that's what we did. And we can't let that happen again. So uh, I, I'm getting to here with my colleagues more and more subdivisions being thrown at me. So we need to have that transportation infrastructure study done in advance so we know what has to happen in the secondary plan. Not the secondary plan provide us that study. Before we even get there, we need to know. Uh, three Chairman, show, can Chairman, I that comment? is correct. So Steve. the approach is, I think, as Mr. Malloy indicated, is as part of the grids to exercise, it's an update on a citywide basis to the transportation master plan, and then getting, once we identify each of the, the growth areas and doing the evaluation, identifying what is the infrastructure that's required to support that growth. But before we get in, it's not just good enough to have a list saying we need a road widening or we need a bus service. What we really want to look at is taking the lead based on some of the work we've been doing in the Fruitland Winona areas, landowner agreements, block servicing strategies that gets much more detailed in terms of the hard and soft infrastructure required for those areas and linking those development approvals back to those infrastructure upgrades. Getting to your point, the last thing you want is 30,000 people using a two-lane rural road when we know that it's got to be a four-lane or a six-lane arterial. 
How do we get that four or six lane road to happen? What's the phasing of development? And what are the linkages between those planning approvals and those infrastructure upgrades and the capital budget piece? So one of the things that we are going to be taking a, a look at though is how does growth pay for growth and how do we link growth to those infrastructure upgrades and having the implementation strategy coming forward with the actual broader secondary plan so we don't get into that situation where we have a significant infrastructure deficit and we have to wait five or 10 years until we get that last piece of the road network or something to be dedicated to the city before we can build that infrastructure. So working with growth management, finance, transportation planning and all our other partners, figuring out all of the infrastructure that's required to support a new growing neighborhood and then putting together the strategy around the implementation of that infrastructure and ensuring that there are the necessary linkages between those planning approvals. So in the past, you know, this council has used holding zones, conditions of draft approval, other matters to say development will not proceed until it's either in the capital budget, the contract has been let, detailed design, et cetera, et cetera, and being very clear in terms of what are those triggers in order to allow development to proceed within the greenfield area. Thank you. So I'll take that up with my colleagues here and we'll draft some type of motion for a comprehensive tr transportation infrastructure study so that we can all be on, on the same page as we go forward. So the last question is to Mr. Zagarek in terms yep. of financial implication. Um, in Hamilton, development has not paid for development. Um, very clearly the DCs that are charged and the increase in the property taxes for greenfield development, there's still about 30% left over that goes to the broader community. So what role does finance have when we're dealing with this type of large study to ensure that um, we're minimizing the impact to the levy for new development? Mike? And that's my last question, Madam Deputy Mayor. I thank my thank colleagues. You. Thank you, Councillor. So through you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor's um, comment with respect to development, paying for development, I would say that the experience across the province is that development does not pay for development, principally because legislation provides discounts as it relates to development related uh, servicing. So whether it is soft services or exemptions. With respect to, um, you heard this afternoon that the official plan must align to places to grow into the provincial forecast and from a budgeting approach, we too align. However, we do not align as it relates to specific years or periods. So while we align for budgeting purposes to the back end of, of the official plan and grids, we, we base our forecasting, our financial forecasting based on our actual experience. And so if we look at the uh, places to grow forecast relative to our actual experience uh, with respect to, as an example, with respect to non-residential, while places to grow may assume 2 million square feet in, in annual growth, uh, we may be assuming 9,500, sorry, 950,000 square feet. And so we base our budgets and our forecasts on actual experience rather than than the places to grow. So how we align is we back end. So we would have back ended to 2031. And now with the revised forecast, we will eventually back end to 2041. Uh, what I would suggest is based on that approach is there are still some very ambitious targets uh, leading up to 2031 and 2041. So I'll use some significant capital projects as an example to try to illustrate how we, we align and what the risks are for the city of Hamilton as it relates to those forecasts and achieving those forecasts. If you look at our 10 year capital program on our rate supported side, you will see two significant projects to accommodate future growth. On the wastewater treatment plant, a $296 million expansion dedicated for growth to be funded principally through development charges for the period 2026 to 2029. That is cash flowed over that period. If we realize a economic slowdown provincially or locally, or we realize a lesser pace of growth, that project 
and the debt associated with that project is borne by existing taxpayers until that growth is realized. The challenge that that represents is that crowds out capacity to fund other competing capital projects, uh, which benefit existing taxpayers and, and improve quality of life. And when a municipality is not able to make those improvements as it relates to quality of life, is that has an impact as it relates to demand for, for growth and where people choose to, to move to. So a bit of a, a bit of a cycle in terms of the risks and needing to manage those risks. So in addition to the wastewater treatment plant expansion, which again is about 2026 to 2029, is a $200 million, I believe $176 million wastewater treatment plan expansion in 2025 to 2027. So those are examples where we need to continue to monitor growth uh, as it relates to how we, we uh, what financing strategies we put forward for council's consideration uh, and how we manage our risks as it relates to growth, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end on uh, some information that uh, was presented this afternoon, and it's uh, highlighted in, on slide 20. So what I found very interesting when, when this presentation was made to SLT a few weeks ago is that the, the ratio of population, I'll just wait as someone's bringing that slide forward. We're almost there. There we go. So what I found uh, very interesting is when you look at the ratio of population to jobs, uh, the period 20, 20, 2001 to 2031, the population to jobs ratio is about 1.6. When you look at that period, the forecast 2031 to 2041, it's a very different experience that we're being advised to plan for and that is to plan for a population to job ratio of 2.5. So going from a, a period of 2001 to 2031 where there is a, a greater availability based on the forecast of jobs to population. What is interesting to me is that 10 year period 2031 to 2041 suggests a much lesser degree of job creation or jobs in this community and, and while still realizing a population growth or forecast. So that as well represents a risk to future councils into this community. If we continue to grow, but we grow to be more of a residential community is what impact will that have as it relates to tax burden? And if we continue to grow residentially, recognizing that all growth is not equal when it comes to tax burden is because tax rates vary across classes and residential having a lower tax rate relative to commercial industrial is looking forward, we will have to try to manage that tax burden as it relates to the mix of development that we have as it relates to residential and industrial. So I just wanted to highlight that as it, uh, it's be, it extends beyond just development charges and our capital program. We need to be mindful in terms of how we are going to grow as it relates to our ca tax competitiveness and ability to pay as well. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you, thank you Mr. Zagarek. That was excellent. And Emmanuel Chair, just to, to to sum up, so frequently we hear from communities, uh, development's bad or development's good. It's not really that way and it's not yes to development or no to development. It's about balance and it's about being sustainable and making sure that we're minimizing the financial impacts to the local taxpayers while maximizing the overall benefits to the community. So it really is about balance as we move forward on this. Thank you for the time. Okay, hey, thank you. And Councillor Ferguson is next, please. Yeah, just two questions. Number one is, can someone just refresh to me the time period for grids one? Joanne? 
Um, through you, Madam Chair, grids one went from 2001 to 2031. Councillor? Okay. And um, what was the forecasted uh, population by 2021 or 2020? Forecasted population for 2020, 2021? Steve? Or even 2031, if you have that handy. 2031. Through the chair. 680,000, we're at 540,000 now. So Heather will provide an answer. Uh, through the chair, in the original, when the original grids was being completed, uh, at that time the population forecast was 660,000 for 2031. It's now increased under the new growth plan to 680,000 to 231. I believe by 2021 it's supposed to be approximately 580, 585,000. I don't have the exact number. That's the number I had in my mind too. Mm -hmm. So we're running about 40,000 behind that now. So my question to you is, if, you, if we weren't right on grids one, how are we supposed to accept that you're right on grids two and that we're gonna see an increase to 660,000 from 540,000 in the next 10 years, 11 years? Okay, Anthony. Uh, yeah, as I was, thank you. As I was uh, <clears throat> just commenting on earlier, there there are some specific reasons why growth over the 2011 to 2016 period fell short. There were some technical reasons. There were some changes to the migration patterns, but really in the post 2016 period, we've seen a return to much more significant levels of growth on both the population and the employment side. And on a metropolitan wide basis, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area is back on track to achieve the 2031 and 2041 forecasts. Uh, but with that said, there is a forecast review pending uh, at the provincial level, and so those numbers might change moving forward as well, and we would have to take that into account as part of GRIDS as well. Councillor? Okay, so, and I also heard you say there was a census data that came out after we set these projections that showed different numbers than what you assumed. Yeah, that's true. The, the growth forecasts that are in the growth plan now uh, were based on the information that was available at the time, and the full range of the 2016 census information wasn't available, but that's not unusual. Um, and there are ways to make fairly accurate estimations of what we expect population and employment to be. The big factor that was unexpected during the 11 to 2016 period was the outmigration to uh, Western Canada in pursuit of opportunities in the oil patch, and that as you know, has, has rather come back the other way, and we've seen significant population growth in Ontario and uh, all communities throughout the GTA, including Hamilton in recent years. The population growth has really, has really picked up. So on a long-term basis, there's still, there's still reasonable forecasts. Councillor? Okay, um, I guess that worries me as we use these grids numbers to make pretty significant capital decisions. And one that comes to my mind is the 10-year uh, transit strategy. And we're running two million passengers behind what we forecast are going to be at. And, um, but we're still going ahead and it's a substantial investment in transit to do that. And, and so we got to make sure these things are much more accurate than they've been in the past. And, you know, there, there could be a story 10 years from now why we didn't hit the target again. So I, I just need to get real comfortable with your forecasts are accurate. I mean, what happens today could determine whether or not the pipeline from Fort McMurray goes across to the BC shores to allow the export of oil, which could bring the oil patch rate back again because their cost of distribution drops significantly. And so I just, I just want to express my mm -hmm. reluctance to accept these numbers when we haven't been right in the past for whatever reason. And, and, um, and I'll, and I'll leave it at that because I know yeah, the, the point is well taken and it's, it's part of a broader Anthony, discussion. excuse me, through the chair and let the councillor finished, okay? Thank you. Well, I lost my train of thought, so I'll let him go ahead. Okay, Anthony, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. And through you, sorry to jump in. I think just as a quick point of clarification as well, the all growth management and long range planning in Ontario, just by legislation, must use the forecast that are in the growth plan. They are the mandated forecast. So there is, I know, a broader discussion of the accuracy of the forecast and who's behind and, and who's ahead. The other big factor that, that changed really the entire metropolitan region, just bent it off its bias, is this huge boom of development that's happening in the city of Toronto. So um, 
the forecasts in the growth plan now for the City of Toronto really don't even apply. I believe that they've already achieved their 2031 employment forecast and if they keep growing it, there's 10 million square feet of office space on the way up in downtown Toronto. If they keep going the way they have been, they will be at their 2041 employment forecast probably 20 years early, sometime around the middle of 2020, probably early 2021. Okay. I, I remember we had a vision 2020. Yeah. And I, as I recall, we're not even close to those targets. I, I, am I correct on that? Anthony? Uh, I, I don't know if you're correct on that. I'd, had, I'd, have, to go, I'd have to go and look, but I think that, that just as an important point of clarification, any growth management exercise that's undertaken by an upper tier or a single tier municipality in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, at this point and until the forecasts are revised, must use the forecasts that are in Schedule 3. And, and I do know that a revision is on the horizon and we'll at a minimum have to look at the City of Toronto because you are, you are correct, they have not been exactly right. And there have been some big changes in distribution and overall growth that weren't expected in the original run. You're telling me we have to accept another party's forecast of what our population would be and you simply plug them in? Correct. And they haven't been right. And they don't have to invest any money based on those projections. Correct and correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor? Last question is, um, what happens if the intensification targets don't, aren't, aren't in sync with our official plan? Let me just shut this down. What happens if our official plan, or our uh, intensification targets are in conflict with our official plan and secondary plan? So intensification is, well, say, can't recall the exact numbers, but a significant increase in intensification in Hamilton. But when that conflicts with the official plan and secondary plan, what takes precedent? Joanne, do you want to answer that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. The intensification rates and the designated greenfield rates at the 50 persons jobs per hectare is measured across the entire city. So there are areas that will be higher and lower as long as the measurement across that whole spectrum on a citywide basis adds up to what that is. So you will have areas where the secondary plan areas might be a little lower than what the rate might be. But I want to say that overall, the urban Hamilton official plan must conform to the growth plan targets. That, that, that is a, a requirement. Okay, my, my so question was, there. what happens when there's a conflict between the official plan, secondary plan, and the intensification targets? I think what you said was, well, the intensification is different in different parts of the city as long as we hit the citywide target. So I think what your answer is, and in fact, you're not correct, tell me, that the official plans and secondary plan are the ruling documents. Joanne? Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, actually the provincial policy is a ruling document. That's our minimum target. Heather was talking about the minimum target. If we are higher, then we must work to the urban Hamilton official plan. They won't be in conflict. I, there, there won't be a conflict. I, I don't see that because we have to conform to the growth plan. If I can assist um, the councillor. Thank you, so Steve. We have a quantum of growth to accommodate through intensification, say X number of units. We, the, the growth plan allow, directs the municipality to come up with a strategy to accommodate our intensification target, our intensification number. And in Hamilton's case, we direct where that intensification is to, is to go based on certain rates, downtown Hamilton, uh, some of the nodes, downtown Waterdown, we're looking at Waterdown node to put an intensification opportunity. We did the secondary plan for the Wilson Street corridor. As long as at the end of the day we're meeting or exceeding that minimum intensification target, therefore not every site therefore has to redevelop at a higher density than what was put in place in our strategy. So through the second and third reiteration of the growth plan, the province has clarified that it's up to it's the municipal role to identify where intensification is to occur and put in place a strategy to help to facilitate that intensification. Including in that then would be looking at what's an appropriate density range or target for an area to redevelop at, but not every site therefore then has to redevelop at a density that's not envisioned provided the secondary plan and the zoning and the official plan is up to date. Thank you, Steve. Councillor? Okay, so I'll be parochial for a minute. Um, I've heard some members of council, including the mayor, uh, say it's time Ancaster took some intensification. We have two lane roads in Ancaster, two main arterial roads, Wilson Street and Garner Street. That's why we put a three floor height restriction in Ancaster, which probably won't meet the intensification targets. So when your staff 
if we approve this grids plan, your staff write an application report for an application. Which one are you going to use to guide you, would you whether you approve or deny? Steve? Through you, Madam Chairman, we would then translate the grids growth management strategy into an update to the official plan, and we would then look at evaluating development proposals against the official plan. So not um, if it was going from, you know, to, if it was taking an existing house and they just wanted to sever it to add and uh, create a new single detached dwelling, that would be a different scenario than if somebody was coming in for a development proposal that didn't meet the evaluation tests and framework that's outlined usually in that official plan or the secondary plan, what the goals and vision are. One of the things we do want to do is knowing that there's a, I think what Mr. Laureus was indicating is there's a finite amount of intensification or redevelopment opportunities within the city of Hamilton and then to align those with public infrastructure investments. That's why we, you know, we updated the downtown secondary plan, updated the zoning along the LRT corridor, the work that's been done along in the Pier 7 and 8 area where we're trying to encourage, promote and direct intensification to certain areas and meet our intensification requirements. And by default, that means that not every other site has to intensify. So we would have to take a look at that specific development proposal, make a determination and see whether or not it fits the broader strategic vision goals and aspirational targets in the official plan and make a recommendation. But at the end of the day, not every site has to intensify at some arbitrary number just because the growth plan requires intensification. Because the, the OMB decision on Granite Road flies in the face of that, Steve. I mean, they were recommending three floors and they were awarded eight floors strictly on intensification. Didn't matter if there's no bus service or no sidewalks or gravel shoulders or all the stuff, it didn't matter, it was just intensification. So let's put out that food for thought. Okay, thank you, Councillor. And next I have Councillor Collins, please. Thanks, Madam Chairman, and through you, um, great presentation. And um, welcome back to the Chambers for Anthony. He's helped us a lot, I know, with our Bayfront strategy and some other projects. I did have some questions around some of the themes that have been raised by both councillors Clark and Ferguson, and that is that there is certainly a disconnect between the provincial policy numbers and the numbers that we see come to fruition with whatever uh, metrics we're using and with whatever measurement um, we're taking. And so how do we then comply with the, seek to comply with the provincial uh, policy uh, guidelines and rules, while at the same time not um, not adopting targets that put us in a position. I think Mike appropriately gave a, a great example in terms of the expansions at the water and wastewater sewage treatment plant. The um, you know we're we're planning and setting aside resources and and taking up um, financial capacity from the city for projects um, that that may or may not need to occur. And so I'm I'm trying to understand how how we give direction. And I, I'm. I was glad to see that triple bottom line at the start of the process, but I, through these processes, and there wasn't a lot here today, from a financial perspective, that seems to be the one that we always gloss over for whatever reason. We really don't talk a lot about assessment growth unless somebody puts up their hand and says, hey, can we have a, a discussion around where growth numbers are, what kind of assessment dollars are we raising in some of these areas? So I, I want to get into that. Um, that market-based lens, I think, was the term that Anthony used in terms of using actuals to assist us with this planning process. And I'm, I'm all for the, you know, we've had people on this council who've put up their hand and said, geez, we need some stretch targets. We would love to see a thousand new apartment buildings in the core, and I think we would all love to, to see that, but the, the market just doesn't there for that. And so symbolically, people have put motions on the table before, and whether it's trying to put all the eggs downtown or no eggs, in the suburban areas, um, even though provincial policy statements force it, um, I want to do something that I, I want uh, this plan, the new plan, the tweaked plan, to um, I, I want uh, I want the plan to uh, a plan in front of us that ensures that we're not um, wasting resources. So I, I, I want to drill down on that issue first. So sorry for the preamble there and a little bit of venting. No problem. But um, I think there's some clear examples. Councillor Clark raised the transportation issue as well. There's some fixes that need to occur with grids one before we adopt new principles for grids two. I don't know who wants to take that on in terms of how do we, how do we implement new numbers and, to, and ensure that we're not um, investing in projects that really don't need to be on the list because the provincial policy numbers may be a little bit too aggressive. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor. And um, I'm looking to the front row. I'm looking at Steve, and I'm looking at Mike. And well, I was going to start off. So, so through the chair, but, but I'm going to ask Mike to follow up because this was the very conversation we had in developing the development charges bylaw. Yep. Was um, we developed an initial cut of DC projects based on the uh, uh, the OP, which is which was based on the Gris One forecasts. Um, that generated a, a, a fairly lengthy list of, uh, of projects to build into the into the DCs, um, and then we took a lens through it of kind of, as the councillor said, that kind of practicality lens of what do we actually think is going to come on stream, uh, where do we think that growth is likely to occur within the, within the lifetime of that DC bylaw, and that resulted in um, pushing out a number of projects into the into the um, uh, post bylaw period. Uh, so that sort of gets to the earlier answer Mike was giving is that uh, from a land use planning standpoint in terms of the adoption and grids to and the adoption of the official plan that's bound to the provincial growth plan and those schedule three forecasts as, as Anthony has said uh, when it comes time to commit in terms of what projects are going to find their way into the DC bylaw uh, we do try to do exactly what the councillor said and put a put sort of a rational lens as to as to what growth we actually think is going to come on stream and when and where and that's what led to the project list that was included in the in the most recently adopted DC bylaw. So through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, I'll expand and uh, I'll use a previous experience to illustrate how we uh, how we consider our actual pace of growth versus uh, forecast pace of growth. So as Jason's identified, beyond uh, budgeting for budgeting purposes, but as well for the development of our DC background study, which informs our uh, development charge bylaw, is staff do consider the pace of development uh, as to what the development needs will be within the current period to 2031. And for those projects that go beyond 2031, as, as Jason's described, we push them out to post period. So development that will occur beyond 2031 and will be borne by development charges uh, at that period. So they aren't incorporated in the current uh, development uh, collections. So the uh, I'll use an example where we had to uh, apply that strategy to avoid significant risk to existing taxpayers. The uh, previous, in, in early 2000, we had a significant expansion to a wastewater treatment plant, which was both environmental and growth related. And staff had concerns with the overall uh, size, financial size of that project and the risk that project could have borne to existing um, ratepayers if we didn't realize the forecast pace of development. So the strategy that staff developed was uh, not only in response to the risk, but as well as an opportunity. So that project received a $100 million grant from the provincial government and staff wanted to consider strategies whereby that grant could be leveraged to benefit existing taxpayers versus sharing that with the development community. The ultimate solution was a two-phased approach to the project. By developing a two-phased approach, the one which was principally environmental upgrades, 85%, I believe, of the expansion, the current expansion um, is related to environmental upgrades and 15% towards growth, is we were able to leverage the $100 million grant to benefit existing ratepayers at the same time as we were able to push out the expansion to, as I mentioned previously, 2026 to 2029, and that uh, better reflected our actual pace of growth and development. So as uh, Jason uh, alluded to, is uh, not only do we apply that, that local growth experience as it relates to budgeting purposes, but we also apply it as it relates to develop, preparing our uh, development background study that uh, again informs our uh, development charge bylaw. So, so hopefully that provides an illustration on how staff look to mitigate risks as it relates to preparing our financial strategies. So thanks for that. Will the practical then, if you wanna call it that approach, apply to the recommendations then that flow through to us as part of the timelines that Joanne gave as it relates to the new targets that may be adopted? 
Heather, do you want to? Yeah, so for the chair, just not quite sure I understood the, the the question in terms of how the practical would flow through. Well, I mean, there's you know there's the discretion here with the dials in terms of, and you know we always part of our economic development plan has stretch goals in it. I'm not certain that this is one of those ones where I want stretch goals because as has been alluded to by several speakers, there are fiscal impacts of developing stretch goals, not meeting them, and then we're forced to pay for projects or capacity for projects that are never gonna happen or won't happen along the timelines that have been planned. And so that certainly, I think we can point to certain projects in terms of grids one where that has occurred because the numbers are a little off. So. Will the recommendations that flow through to us later next year be closer to the what we expect to see the market develop over the next 10 to 20 years? So through the chair, I think the intent in terms of what staff would, would, would bring forward is, is, is not a sort of an aspirational st uh, stretch goal of what we hope the future would be, okay. um, but it would reflect um, what staff's best sort of estimate in terms of what, what would good planning look like um, and from the standpoint of where we think the, the, the policy objectives are, but also where the market is going to take us. That, that's kind of the balance that, that staff will have to play through in what we bring forward to you. I would anticipate that notwithstanding our best efforts in that regard, given that we are still ultimately bound to the growth plan forecast and what we bring forward, that the analysis that Mike just talked about around each time our DC bylaws come up, we have to do some adjustment of some of the projects. I would think that's still gonna have to be common practice. Um, each time we are we are reflecting our for, for our DCs for all of the reason that uh, that Mike gave. Okay. Other question I have is related to um, the assessment growth. So how is that factored into this plan? And I know for as much as it pains us to to hear this every year, the vast majority of our new assessment that is generated in the municipality is from residential development, and of course the vast majority of that residential development are in some of the growth areas. We know them to be in Brookstone Creek, Flamborough, and some pockets in Ancaster. So if, um, A, I wanted to understand what, how can that plan increase assessment growth? So Anthony touched on a lot of factors we don't usually talk about here, and that is external factors that um, some of our competitors are going through. So some of the municipalities around us are built right out. They have to build up, they can't build out. So we can offer a product that others can't from a market perspective. Um, some of them just can't keep up with the pace of development, so we've certainly been the beneficiary of that overflow from Toronto. People make their way here and other places because there's the affordability issue, and Anthony, I think, captured all of those. So back to the fiscal leg of that three-legged stool, how can, what, what kind of direction can we give at a later time to develop a plan that generates more than just 0.8 to 1.1 assessment growth per year? Are there parts of this plan that can be tweaked to increase that number so that we're more competitive than we have been in the past? Using the plan to boost re residential, or sorry, assessment growth. It doesn't necessarily have to be residential, but assessment growth. So I think everyone's just sorting out who's going to answer that. Yeah, answer and through the chair, there, there might be a couple of us want to weigh in, but I, but I guess what I would start by saying is similar to the, the, the answer to the previous question is, um, as with planning for, for job growth, it's not something where we'd be bringing forward something that is, again, aspirational and a hoped for future that we actually don't think is, is achievable. So um, I, I, I suspect that if you go back to some of the original growth plan forecast back in 2006, you would see that there was a bit of that in there. And, and when municipalities have talked about missing some of the growth plan targets um, in, in sort of the 2016 census year, for the most part, municipalities were a little, were, were missed slightly on the population numbers and more significantly on the employment numbers because I think there was some more aspirational employment growth built into that plan. Um, so in terms of the employment that we're planning for, um, that slide that you have up there is, is a pretty good indication of one of the issues we're going to face um, in the future as those ratios start to decline. Um, and that is the employment that, that, that we have to be planning for. So again, we can put in the permissions. Uh, we already have uh, put in the permissions for significant employment growth in the city um, with significant lands uh, uh, designated around the AEGD. Um, but we do have to balance that against what the actual forecast suggests that we will be achieving in terms of job growth in the city. 
So we did, thank you for that, Jason. Through you, Madam Chairman, we did have job growth at the airport as one of our targets in the last plan. Right now we're advertising lands at the airport for development and we don't have the servicing to make that happen. So that's why, you know, when I'm talking about growth, doesn't, I'm not necessarily talking about residential. From an employment standpoint, I think there's a long way to go in terms of improving what we promised on the first plan in terms of as we make our way into, into grids too. So if I raise, use that as an example, are there other areas where we kind of over-promised and under-delivered? I would use the airport as a prime example um, in terms of accelerating assessment growth as part of the new plan. So through the chair, I think if you look at where our significant employment growth is is, is forecast through this uh, planning period, the GRIDS 2 planning period, uh, the AEGD does become a significant uh, part of that. So uh, so yes, yeah, servicing that those lands in the short term um, is a priority. Um, that is the, the area where we see capturing a lot of the employment growth um, as well as the employment growth through intensification. So we continue to see the downtown core is an area accommodating a lot of the growth. Um, what's uh, a little bit new in this round of, uh, of grids planning is the Stelco lands coming back on stream as potential areas for employment growth. So um, those are really, uh, I'd say, the big three. Uh, we still have some capacity in some of our other business parks and employment areas, but it's, it's down to smaller parcels at this point. Um, so uh, to, to the councillor's point, uh, yes, I think as we start to look at servicing priorities, uh, the, the AEG area uh, is, is certainly that. Okay. My last question is transportation. So, uh, you know, when I look at my own area, when it was developed in the 60s and 70s, certainly just before I was born, um, the transportation network was in place. You could argue Red Hill should have been a part of that mix at that point in time, but it wasn't. But looking at the arterial roads and everything that um, is currently there now and functioning still, um, the malls, the commercial, the residential was all built up and, and the, the transportation network was built either before or concurrent with those developments. The system we have now just isn't working. And you know I've listened to, I don't know how many um, good uh, debates from and um, speeches from Councillor Partridge in terms of the growth pressures in, in Flamborough and the downside of developing these areas ahead of having a proper transportation network in place. Councillor Clark and, and others above the escarpment are dealing with that in Stony Creek. And of course, Councillor Ferguson appropriately raised some of the issues that he's dealing with in Ancaster. So this trend of growth coming first, transportation then coming afterwards just isn't working. And I think if there's a red circle to put on something in the plan that comes to us next year, that has to be addressed because it's, um, it's really is a backwards system. And there isn't a planning application that comes from any of those areas where somebody doesn't raise transportation as an issue. And for as, as much as we can try to invest in transit in those areas, and the transportation plan seeks to do that with the 10 year plan, if there isn't a lot of take up with those buses that are running through those areas, we're forced then to deal with the, you know, accommodating vehicles. Um, that are on those streets and the roads and there's no shortage there's no shortage of ones to list are all over capacity so i i'm anxious to see what the the new plan has in store for us in that regard in terms of suggesting here's another path that you can use to avoid that um, but that that has to be addressed so not maybe a, a, a question on that one but certainly a comment i certainly endorse the comments of councillors clark and ferguson in that regard Okay, thank you, Councillor Collins. Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, my question is concerning um, the alignment of our policy and budgetary practices with our alleged goals. So I, I would hope that uh, when we go f move forward, um, rather than saying, we didn't achieve our intensification targets. I would really appreciate a closer drill down and com some comparative analysis of why we didn't and what kind of policy and what kind of investments do we need in order for us to actually realize those targets. And I'm going to give you just a few examples. Um, what was mentioned earlier, I think, by Anthony was um, there was some reference to um, in our efforts to intensify, however, we're not building the kind of units 
um, that facilitate different types of families. And I know there is an outstanding ask for a family family friendly policy with respect to our intensification development. Um, we keep approving one or one and a half bedroom units and that's what the market provides, but how do we um, as a municipality ensure that if we are um, really committed to intensification, we enable all types of different um, people to live in intensified uh, areas, which in turn support a whole bunch of other policy objectives we have, like filling up empty classrooms, um, not closing down local schools, and uh, supporting our transit. Um, when will that be done? And will it be done? Also including our pricing practices. Are we really, if we're not hitting our intensification targets, have we done and will we be doing an assessment of do our pricing practices actually favor greenfield development over um, existing urban development? Um, I think there's some evidence to suggest that it, uh, it's biased in favor of greenfield development. Um, there's lots of evidence, emerging evidence, of what makes nodes and corridors successful. It is um, sometimes some conflicting practices. So people want to, we're encouraging people to live on corridors and in, within around nodes with the promise of um, a better lifestyle in terms of pedestrian friendly life, but we're not following through in policy and in practice in pedestrian friendly environments. We're still expecting people to live on arterial corridors that are not hospi hospitable at all and not in keeping with that which we promised, those nice glossy brochures. When will we be doing that? And then the internal conflicts that sometimes come with that. Um, maybe some transportation engineers who say we need this many lanes of traffic in order to accommodate this kind of per unit development. But that's not the whole point of intensification. It's um, to try and realign those resources. And the, f the final thing, which I'm going to leave, is there was a detailed study done by some faculty and staff out of the University of Waterloo. And it was really drilling down by trying to look at, as people were aging, what was it that was trying to convince them to move out of those single-family homes into more intensified developments. And actually, after a, a lot of drilling down, what they found, the number one factor, were trees. Um, they were looking for developments that had the appropriate type of greenery around them. And I know that sounds simplified, but it, it was an amazing study. It was really rich um, and, and very informative. So. That's my question is, have we done an assessment of whether our policies and our investments actually support the goals of intensification? And if we haven't, will we, so that we know going forward the types of investments and policies that we need to put in place uh, that will make the, our intensification targets more likely to be realized. All right, who'd like to tackle that one? There's so a two-part question in there. Jason, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple parts in there, and I'll start, and Steve and Anthony may want to, may want to weigh in as well. Uh, there are, I, I would say that, yes, there are a number of things that have been put in place from a policy standpoint to try to make the intensification targets happen. Um, uh, and, and I will say, actually, you know, from my experience in other, in, in other municipalities, that's not always the case. I have seen other municipalities who, who stick a target into their official plan and that's the end of it. Um, I think, uh, to Hamilton's credit, it has followed through with not just policy responses, uh, and I would point to the uh, zoning changes and secondary plans that have been put in place in some of the areas that have been identified to accommodate that intensification to actually create as of right 
development permissions. Uh, the, the downtown is, is an obvious one. The transit-oriented corridor is an obvious one. The Centennial neighborhoods all have been done over the past couple of years to create those as-of-right permissions, which in other jurisdictions don't necessarily follow on once an, a city has, has adopted a target. Uh, and the second, uh, I think, significant thing uh, that the city has done has also supported that with, with financial instruments, which again is, is, is not common. Uh, but in terms of the incentive programs uh, and DC programs that have put in place to try to financially incentivize some of that intensification to happen. So I think those are two of the key aspects of, 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 of a, a response. Um, that said, uh, certainly I think there's, there's always more that can be done and, 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 and typically um, in the official plan as it identifies different areas to accommodate the lion's share of that intensification, those become priority areas for what in the past have been either secondary plan level policies or streetscape studies, those sorts of things to try to create the amenity environment um, that is also critical to attracting that, uh, that growth and development. Um, the councillor also asked about the, the, the family friendly guidelines. I might ask uh, uh, Steve to weigh in on that one. Okay, Steve. And then I think Anthony may want to uh, have a comment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. That is, uh, the councillor is correct. Staff are working on um, updating our official plan policies around condominium conversions, and we're also doing work on the family friendly guidelines and policy framework around that with the intent to bring forward a report to this com to planning committee in Q1 of 2020 on those issues. Um, I think we, there is a high degree of alignment with staff in terms of we're focusing, as you were talking about, uh, seniors, trees, and that. We are also working on the urban forestry strategy. And you will find that uh, part of the reason the focus on good urban design is the emphasis that we've been placing relating to quality of life over just standard of living considerations and ensuring we're creating those high quality uh, urban places that are attractive and usable on a 24, 365 basis as opposed to just being programmed for certain select points of the day. Anthony? Anthony? Yes, uh, thank you. And, and through you, the the dynamic of intensification is driven so strongly by demand. Planning policy is an important part. The regulatory environment is an important part. But at the end of the day, when you look at the distribution of intensification throughout the metropolitan area, it really comes down to the relative attraction of locations for that type of investment. If we talk about market-based demand, if the interest is to achieve more intensification, it has to be more than, as, as Jason indicated, just simply a target in the plan, which is not what the city has done. There is much more in place in terms of a planning framework to promote it, but it has to be an environment in which people want to live densely in urban forms with high amenity. So it, it actually invokes a discussion of much broader factors which uh, include uh, you know, investment attraction, economic development, maybe an office strategy for downtown, streetscape improvements, uh, the work that's going on in the environment. So there is a lot that, that can be done. Can, can more be done? I'm sure more could always be done. But fundamentally, from a market perspective, the way to consider intensification is that putting the environment in place where more people want to live, providing the opportunity and providing the framework, and then the market will respond with those units. And we're, we're seeing it happen now. It is currently being driven quite strongly by spillover from the City of Toronto, especially on the high-rise residential market. But over time, as Hamilton continues its resurgence as an economic and cultural centre, it will become a magnet for that type of development in its own right. And I can tell you, I, I live, I don't live in downtown Toronto, but we live in central Toronto in the East End. And every time I'm in the north end of Hamilton, I, I think to myself, I can close my eyes and, and imagine that I'm standing on Queen West or some of those really densely developing the city of Toronto neighborhoods. Over time, the growth will continue and the amenities will come and it, it will incrementally increase to a point where there's, where there's more intensification. So I would say that it really is about the quality of the urban form and that's a much broader discussion than, than the intensification target that we put in the plan. From a land needs assessment, what really matters is um, that share really does have a huge influence because it, it affects the amount of greenfield designations that we provide and there is a risk that growth falls short and we run into fiscal and service delivery challenges. So from my perspective, it's fundamentally from a market-based platform about increasing the attraction of the city as a location for that type of investment while maintaining a balanced housing supply so that you can manage 
you know, there will be short-term variability in the amount of development that occurs. From, from where I sit, the big risk is planning for this huge shift in the pattern of development that doesn't materialize or it doesn't materialize in time. And you have to sort of backfill things like transportation networks and the financing of growth. So okay. fundamentally, it's about the attraction of the city as a location for investment. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you, Anthony. On that, in terms of the attraction and um, investing for success, um, given your knowledge of the GTA, um, would you care to comment on, because there's been reference made to transportation investments and planning, uh, the role of, of transit in success for intensification and nodes and corridor planning? Just, uh, just to make sure, I through you, to, I understand the question. Just a, a comment on on the on the on the role of, of transportation investment and intensification. Transit in particular. Transit in particular. Transit, yeah. Yeah, uh, obviously it plays a key role in encouraging intensification. The the pattern of development in the city of Toronto, just to use an example of a very high demand environment. That is really driven by the accessibility provided, both on the employment and population side, is really driven by the accessibility provided by Union Station. And the irony really is that the more congested the metropolitan region gets, the more accessible downtown Toronto becomes to the maximum labor force. So that makes it very attractive for major employers, which makes it very attractive for high-rise developments, and you start this virtual cycle of office towers and residential development. That is probably a little further down the line in terms of Hamilton's growth outlook, but if the City of Toronto experience tells us anything, that there is definitely merit in, in looking long on some of these things. Um, myself included, I don't think many people saw what was going to happen in the City of Toronto, and you know, one of the mistakes that they made, for example, was not getting ahead of the transit investment, especially locally, and not buying enough parks. Uh, which is a critical problem there right now and probably will never get any better. So it's, 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 um, it's definitely part of the picture. Again, there are many different factors involved and the fact that the city is ahead of it is, in my opinion, definitely a positive in terms of the likelihood for intensification. And we are only now seeing it, if I recall, the, the eye on the light rail transit system in the region of Waterloo, I might not have this exactly correct, but it was approved 15 years ago. And it is only now that we're seeing a substantial amount of development within that corridor and through intensification there. So there is a, a timing aspect as well. So it plays a huge role. And uh, compared to other locations in the metropolitan region, Hamilton is, is certainly well advanced in its efforts to put the pieces in place that are going to be required to deal with growing intensification over time. Okay, thank you. Councillor? All right, and next I have Councillor Pearson, please. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor, and uh, certainly appreciate all the comments and the presentation. It was excellent. I am going to ask if we can possibly have that slide presentation sent to all of us or provided. Stephanie, I'm not sure if I missed you saying something. No, to you, Madam Deputy Mayor, it was sent by link only. As it was over 50 pages, we don't normally include, but if you'd like a hard copy, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, I'd appreciate that because I'd like to make my notes on it as we went through the presentation part. Um, and I appreciate, and I think a number of my concerns have been, been mentioned already, and certainly first and foremost is the um, upgrades to the urban, urban areas where development's going to occur and the major impacts this is having. <clears throat> so I know it was mentioned by Anthony as far as Fruitland Winona, the 70 persons and jobs per hectare. I mean, they're all rural roads, and there's massive development coming just as I speak. It's, it's being built now. So I know residents are asking questions, well, when does my arterial road get urbanized and when do we get this going forward? Generally, our comments always been, well, growth enables us to bring those services in, but they're at a much later date. So um, I have major concerns with that. <clears throat> I don't know if you want to comment, Anthony, or, or staff, but staff <coughs> specific, specific and to I was, the growth. I was surprised to... So Fruitland Winona as the 70 jobs and persons per hectare. That was through our... Fruitland Winona secondary plan process. So I'm really, um, I'm not objecting because I know that we went through the process, but it's quite an aggressive development that's going on in that area. Um, the other part of it I want to just mention too is with the growth is the concerns that are now coming to light with regards to Barton Street and the promenade and with regards to the Arvin Avenue extension. So we have a number of issues and it's like just keep throwing the balls up in the air 
and seeing where staff and we can land and lining these all up. So I'm not sure how anyone up there is going to bring this all forward with, the, with this whole process. So specific to the, uh, the Winona area and Councillor Pearson's developments that are coming down the tubes as we speak. Steve, do you want to comment um, on that? Thank you, Madam Chairman. So there's two sort of separate issues. One is the Arvin Avenue extension, which staff have identified and continue to work with the property owners to protect for that Arvin Avenue extension, and then to look at how we finance the actual construction to provide an alternative truck route to take trucks off of Barton Street. So there's that element to the strategy. We've been having the ongoing discussions with the landowners required to dedicate some land to the city for the road allowance. We continue to have those conversations with those landowners about the timing and the conditions attached to them dedicating the land and any cost recoveries that would flow back onto those property owners. The block servicing strategy is to resolve sort of the, some of the other transportation issues. And that's why we have not, with the exception of the one piece that was outside of the block servicing strategy, which is currently moving forward through the development review process, the balance of the lands, we're saying that development must adhere to that block servicing strategy to ensure that the, both the hard, the surface and the subsurface infrastructure is provided in a coordinated fashion. The one issue that you are correct that we've identified is the implementation along Barton Street from the existing homeowners that are not part of any development or redevelopment proposal. And then how do we upgrade Barton Street if those homeowners aren't prepared to participate in a development or redevelopment scheme? Um, and then having a conversation with those property owners about the upgrades to Barton Street. So it is high on staff's radar in terms of coordinating those infrastructure upgrades, recognizing the importance, the dual function that Barton serves, not only serving the residential community, but serving the employment community and how we sort of balance those two issues. And I think we have those conversations, probably myself and growth management staff on a weekly basis when we're looking at how we coordinate development through the block servicing strategy to respond to those issues. Councillor. Thank you, appreciate that. And I'm gonna ask another question. It's with regards to, I think it was Heather mentioned um, in the Binbrook area about the possibility of somebody coming in and bringing a plan forward for up to 10 hectares, if I remember you said. But is this not Greenbelt area? Heather? Uh, to, the <laughs> to the chair, you're correct. Uh, the Greenbelt uh, plan does allow an expansion only from two areas within our rural area, that being Waterdown and Binbrook, that can expand into the Greenbelt, and it's 10 hectares, so it's fairly yeah. minimal. The rest of the city cannot expand into the green belt. So and, and and sorry, that was, only 50% of that can be for residential purposes. Okay, so that was my question because of the um, E.D. Smith lands in Winona being zoned green belt, so they are not included. Just Waterdown and Benbrook. That's correct. Those lands cannot expand. Alrighty, thank you for that, and I just look forward to getting the presentation and listening to further comments. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor. And next, I have uh, Councillor Danko, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just have four questions. I uh, thought it was a really intriguing um, discussion so far and, and uh, presentation. Um, I'm just going to touch on, on the two dials, the intensification part and then the greenfield density uh, first. So Councillor Wilson brought up uh, quite a few of the points on the intensification part. I thought it was really interesting on the, uh, the demand needs to change and the relative attraction of those uh, developments in order to hit our densification targets. So through you, Madam Chair, to Anthony, I, I think. Um, how much is there a reciprocal uh, relationship between our urban intensification and uh, what would otherwise be rural or suburban intensification? Anthony? Uh, thank you, and, and through you, there is, uh, Hamil just to step back um, a, a bit, a a ha the, a Hamilton's context is unique within a broader metropolitan uh, perspective because there is, there is a, a, you know, a, I don't want to say an actual central city market because I think the Vaughan Metropolitan Center people would disagree with me, but there's a robust and surging downtown high-rise market as well as a greenfield traditional family-oriented development. So. Uh, in order for the city of Hamilton to achieve its growth forecast, both of those um, have to move forward. And what we find is that it's really the age structure that is driving the demand for the, the ground-related housing. There was a, a comment earlier about um, the elderly leaving their homes, and typically that tends to happen sort of around um, 80 years old. And I believe, if I, if I recall, the peak of the baby boom is... Uh, I think 1959 or 1960. So that means that the largest age group in the GTA today uh, will not be hitting the point where they want to necessarily vacate a ground-related home until 
probably sometime around 2040. So the demographic trends really in terms of the relationship between intensification and ground-related housing aren't, aren't helping if we're seeking to achieve a very aggressive intensification target. So really it is fundamentally about the attraction of the downtown area and other nodes and corridors as a location for investment. And the evidence on the ground-related housing is the city is, of course, free to, to set a higher intensification target or a, or a higher greenfield density target, but we really are seeing some very interesting evidence of people simply driving until they can afford to have a home. So that is, that, that is the larger risk, but yes, they definitely are connected. Okay, Councillor. Thank you. And on the discussion of the importance of transit, of course, the city of Hamilton is planning and currently under, uh, under tender now for LRT. Um, along that corridor is a big part of what we're considering for our urban intensification. Looking at the timelines here um, for when this review is set to be finished, how will that tie in, how, how important is that LRT development into our targets and our long-term plans? I, hugely important. The evidence shows that transit plays a significant role, uh, you know, if the other pieces are in place as well in encouraging intensification, but uh, our, our preliminary view is that the bulk of the development along the LRT corridor will likely be longer term in nature. The part that overlaps the downtown, if you look at the historic, both at the mid-rise and the high-rise level, there really is just such a strong concentration of apartment development, as, as, as you know, uh, in central Hamilton. When the West Harbor lands come on stream, that's going to be a significant change for the north end. So we expect to see, from a distribution perspective, more of what's been happening in recent years. So there'll continue to be a concentration of growth in central Hamilton. And that's not necessarily because the transit investment is there, but the market will, it will signal to the market, uh, you know, a longer term plan for intensification. And so there will be growth along that corridor. In the immediate term, the part that overlaps with the current concentration of development and then longer term, probably probably towards McMaster first and then going in the other direction later. So uh, judging from the experience in the region of Waterloo, it, 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 is, it is even some time after it is, it is constructed that you see significant development. So it's definitely a part of the picture, but uh, I, I would imagine it to be somewhat longer term in nature. Councillor? Thank you. Uh, I think it's, it's really important to keep that in perspective. Um, when we're developing these kinds of plans and there are parts of these plans that are um, still under discussion. On the greenfield density side, um, I believe it was 50 people in jobs per hectare was, was the goal. And I believe I saw in the report that a lot of our greenfield uh, developments now are upwards of 70 people in jobs per hectare. So is there, um, is it realistic to, to take that dial and crank that up to what we're already seeing being developed today? Uh, through you, uh, just I guess as a point of clarification, the, the growth plan target is 50 residents and jobs per hectare. Hamilton's current greenfield area is roughly 56 residents and jobs per hectare. We have specific examples that are, that are higher and lower and a couple were up on the screen. It's the new areas that are planned mm -hmm. at a higher density. And to follow up on the, the question about Fruitland Winona, which is at 70 residents and jobs per hectare, the, the issue from a land needs perspective there is the housing mix that's required to achieve the level of density. And I understand that there's a fair amount of row housing in that area, which I can tell you from a market perspective is going to make it extremely attractive for first time home buyers because from a pricing perspective, row houses are more affordable generally speaking, all things being equal than a comparable detached home and much cheaper than a similar sized apartment. So for the new areas to go forward at 70 definitely will involve a mix that has more medium and higher density unit forms, which if it is pushed too far without the appropriate supports in place could work against the intensification objectives inside the built boundary. Councillor? Thank you. Um, on the, the urban boundary expansion, um, as a, I think everybody knows, there's now a, a legislative avenue for developers to put in piecemeal um, urban boundary expansions. If those were to go ahead, if those were to be approved, how would that play into our long-term planning? Because in, in my mind, it basically nullifies any of this 
planning if, we, if we're just going to have piecemeal um, urban boundary expansions as one-offs. Um, do you have a comment on that? Heather? Steve? Uh, through the chair, um, I mean, the simple answer is that if one of the, uh, an urban boundary expansion was approved prior to the MCR, um, we would have to then rectify our land needs assessment against that, that new land uh, being added to the urban boundary. So it would factor into our overall land need that we would have already added additional lands then to our urban boundary, which could accommodate our future growth. Uh, that's a simple view. Of course, if we do receive one of these applications, a formal application, we will be reviewing them against an evaluation framework, which we would, would be comprehensive and would take a similar approach to our MCR evaluation. Uh, but it would have to be factored into our overall land need if it were to be approved. Yes, sir. Thank you. And my final question is, is we talked, we've talked about the growth. Um, we've, we've talked about the financial aspects of growth, which I think are critically important to our municipality being um, dependent on residential growth as, as our tax base. Uh, we've talked about the triple bottom line. Um, my question is on the environmental side, of course, climate change is, uh, has been declared as an emergency by this municipality. And it's been said that land use planning is Ontario's tar sands. So in terms of our land use planning, our, our, our plan for development, how is it anticipated that climate change will um, figure into those discussions? Uh, through the chair, I think uh, utilizing a climate change lens will be a key component of our evaluation framework going forward. And we certainly haven't established uh, a framework yet. It still is something to be uh, created, but I personally see climate changes crossing many aspects of the framework. So it'll tie into uh, infrastructure considerations and low impact development, ensuring we're planning for transit supportive and complete walkable communities and connections with existing areas. Uh, I see it crossing many bounds and then it also will be involving our staff in uh, public health and, and the climate change task force to see if we can look at some, including some uh, emissions modeling and, uh, and impact uh, modeling from, from new proposed developments. So we see it crossing several aspects of the future evaluation framework still to be worked out and we'll be getting input on that from stakeholders and the public, but it will be an important component. Councillor? Good, thank you. Uh, those are all my questions. Um, looking at the, uh, the time frame ahead of us, I think we're, we're on the right track. And uh, as a municipality, um, I think we have a, a clear idea of, of where we're trying to get to and to accommodate the growth because at the end of the day, our, our community is gonna grow one way or another. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. And I have Councillor uh, Brenda Johnson and then I have Councillor Narendra Nan, then I put myself on the list, and then I'll ha go to second time speaker, Councillor Clark. Councillor Johnson, please. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the notices for your public information centers that you want to set up, I would really appreciate the electronic version to that so we can post them on our website and get them in our local newspapers. We have some really good contacts there that can help out with advertising. Um, I'll be honest with you, this is the first time I've ever heard about the 10 hectares for Bimbrook and Waterdown. I can't speak for my Waterdown um, counselor, but this is the first time, and for those that don't know what 10 hectares is, it's about 25 acres. For, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't seem like a lot for some people, but for the village of Bimbrook, that's a big chunk of land. It's also completely surrounded by the green belt. It's, and I thought, when I heard about this Bill 108, that we were going to hold the line especially in the green belt. Yeah. So that's more of a comment, um, but I've heard tons of conversations, tons of reasonings about the lands that are on 20 Road. They're in the white belt, not the green belt. They abut onto servicing, whereas Bimbrook has just, Bimbrook has just been um, going through flooding issues because of the tunneling and capacity issues is still on the docket. So now we're going to open it up for 25 acres more. Where did it say Bimbrook was going to open up for 25 acres more? Uh, Joanne, through, or Heather? Through the chair. Uh, that Excuse is a me. provision. Councillors, councillors, sorry. Keep the chatter down, please, around the table. Heather? That, that was added in when the, uh, the Greenbelt Plan and the Growth Plan were revised uh, in the most recent round of revisions. I must stress, though, so that it, the opportunity is there to expand. 
from Bainbrook Carbotter Dam, that doesn't mean that that will necessarily occur. So um, staff certainly haven't done the review or the, made any determinations on that. It just is that there is a policy provision that would allow that to occur if it was deemed to be appropriate. Um, there's been no decisions made at this time. I can also say anecdotally, I haven't received any inquiries or any um, requests from landowners in the Binbrook area about that. But again, it's, it provides the opportunity. It doesn't mean that it will actually occur. Well, that's great to hear because we keep pushing back on the 20 road folks because we keep telling them the MCR is being completed. So we're holding a group of landowners on one side and the, the communities on one side to say, we're doing a very good comprehensive review of where we should be expanding. And then Bill 108 comes in and, the, and we just found this out. This is still, again, news to me. I'm sticker shocked by this one. But it's okay, we can probably accept some applications for the Bimbrook Village. And for some of you who have not heard me say this in the last eight years a thousand times over, planning schools across Canada point to Bimbrook and say, don't do that. Do not do that. It is the biggest and the, the best case of leapfrogging in planning world you have ever seen. And we are still living with the problems associated with leapfrogging. When I look at 20 Road, it almost looks like a dog's breakfast because you have rural on one side, urban on another, some rural on the, on the north side, and then you have urban on the south side. It's not consistent right across the board. I know the planning department has the same frustrations as I do, but when I hear, but it's okay, we can do one-offs over here, it completely takes the 20 road group and just throws them into a, a meat grinder. Because I know the, the uh, AG, AEGD um, OMB decision was that they were to take two plots of land. If you look on appendix D, there are two, oh sorry, not D. Yes, D, sorry. There are two plots of land south on, to, on 20 Road, um, just east of Lancaster Road, that the OMB took those out. No rhyme or reason. Big block of land, and they said, you know, these two pieces look good, we're going to pull them out. So there's another opportunity if we need to expand because the servicing is there and we can urbanize the road, planning makes sense because it's done in an orderly fashion. But leapfrogging, all we're doing is exasperating it. So those are my comments for Bimbrook, um, just putting that out there. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and as far as, and I heard um, a comment, sorry, my, my notes are all over the place so I may just keep going back and forth. When I heard about the Alfreda and what the fields are being used for today, and I think some of you will recall, Mr. Robichaud and Ms. Jo uh, Joanne Hickey-Evans, the OMB decision for the blob stated that we don't look at the use of the lands that are being done today, but we look at what their potential is. So a perfect example is any lands that are south of Highway 8 in Winona area in particular, any farmer worth his grain of salt will tell you that the location and soil, the soil um, conditions in that area alone are prime for tender fruit. Tender fruit's a really um, difficult crop to make a lot of money on, but you can if you do it south of Highway 8. But they have been all bought up by speculators and they've been sitting dormant. So do we go to the OMB and say, well, they're just fields? No, the potential is that they could be something better. Um, so that's my comment for that one. Also, the one thing about Scooby, and I still have the knife marks on my back from it, the secondary plan, was that the development was planned, it was to be done in segments and using the block strategy, um, servicing strategy, that, all, that forces all the landowners to work together to ensure that the infrastructure is in place prior to the building being done. So that was the one thing good that came out of that planning um, process was that I'm hoping we do that going forward everywhere because blocks, block um, servicing strategy really seems to work. Uh, it puts the, the um, infrastructure in place. I'm gonna jump back to the AEGD OMB, OMB, OMB decision, sorry. Um, so, my understanding, if I read Appendix F, the OMB decision partly, uh, if I read it out of context maybe, the agreement was that Alfreda lands would be looked at first and then the 20 road lands would be looked at second. Am I, did I get that part of the decision right in this? Heather? 
Through the chair, that's correct. So where does the, um, where does the uh, municipal comprehensive review fit in all of this? Because I look at your, your chart and it says, this is a requirement for the city to update its official plans, conform to the new provincial plans. The time horizon for the MCR is 2041. And yet when I look at Appendix D, it is residential from 2031 and beyond. And that includes all the lands that are in the decision. So where does the MCR come in? Heather, do you want to start? Sorry, I missed the last half of your question. Could you repeat that? Yeah, I hate when people talk around me too. Um, so if I look at your chart, it talks about the, the municipal comprehensive review and it's a requirement for the city to update its official plan is to use this exercise. Time horizon for this MCR is 2041. But when I look at Appendix D, I'm looking at all the lands that were in this OMB decision, the 20 road um, west, 20 road east, and Al Frida, and I see that they're all going for the 2031. So I don't understand, how, how do you harmonize those two? Heather? Uh, through the ch ch chair, sorry, the, um, to date the only firm uh, council approved direction in terms of where growth will be accommodated to 2031 is the Al Frida lands, which came out of the first uh, grids process. Uh, that chart that we showed you, or that map, uh, that we showed you where it had all the different white belt opportunity areas. Those were saying that those those are uh, those lands could accommodate growth to 2031 or beyond, uh, just because we don't at this point know how much growth or how much land we will need to 2031. We have to relook at that those 2031 numbers. The overall population forecast has changed, and the provincial planning targets are changed. So we're not entirely sure how much growth we're actually going to need. 2031, we know it will be different than what the original grid study in terms of land area identified. So we know based on those, those white belt lands are the areas that we can consider for growth because they're not restricted by the green belt. Uh, but we do have council direction that El Frida is the, uh, the first growth option to 2031. Beyond 2031, we don't know yet and that's still being considered through the Municipal Comprehensive Review. Okay, so where are we with the MCR? Uh, through the chair, the MCR, that's uh, right now we're in phase two of the process. So we're looking at the background work and the intensification study, looking at how much intensification we can accommodate in different areas of the city and what we were just talking about today with the demand side, looking at the density, what we're going to establish for the density target, also employment lands, which we haven't touched on too much today, but we're reviewing that as well. All of those studies are going to feed into the land needs assessment, which we're hoping to bring foot back in February. And that is the document which will ultimately tell us how much additional land we may require. And it's following that determination that then we look at where we will be growing. And so that would be the fourth phase. And we're anticipating that would be next year uh, following uh, the completion of the land needs assessment. So that's when we start to look at where we will be growing and when, because there will be a temporal or a phasing aspect as well to consider. Okay, thanks, Heather. So the MCR is, is all the above, then does grids fall under the MCR direction or does the MCR follow under grids direction? Because it looks like you've already predetermined where things should grow when I look at your maps. Heather? Through the chair, uh, they're, they're really concurrent. I wouldn't say that one falls under the other, They just, but they're both planning to the same ultimate planning horizon of 2041. The MCR um, goes a little bit beyond grids in that it will include our official plan review as well, ultimately. Um, uh, which we'll be bringing forward later following determination of preferred growth options. But no, I don't want it to appear that we've predetermined any growth options. Again, that map that you're looking at just shows uh, potential growth areas. We know because we have such little amount of white belt land in our city that there's very few areas where we can grow. Uh, the white belt is very limited. So that's just showing the, the potential growth areas. It's not showing which will ultimately be selected how much we need or uh, where the growth will first occur. Councillor? Oh, this is so frustrating. Okay, I'm just gonna end off with a, with a comment about uh, senior living. Um, Ward 11 possesses many village type developments that are geared to senior living. And my own anecdotal <laughs> experience in seniors downsizing are for a number of reasons. One, closer to family. Two, no stairs and three, little to no outside work, easy outside maintenance. So I just wanted to put that out there. I like the comment about the row houses, 
because you'll see a lot of these developments have the row houses, but believe it or not, when you look from the outside, they look very tiny. When you go inside, they're, they, they really have a lot of space. Um, but anyways, I just hope, and I really want to drill down this, the Bimbrook urban boundary expansion here, folks. I really do, because I see so many other spaces as the development, or the um, planning department will tell you that we're trying to push to get the white belt developed before we, we even look at the green belt. In fact, I can't understand why we're even looking at the green belt. But thank you, those are my comments. Okay, thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Nan, please. Thank you, through the chair. Thank you to staff and Anthony for the presentation. Um, I definitely learned a lot and have some follow-up questions offline, particularly around the triple bottom line. Um, we've heard a lot about the the need to, the what was it? There's a, um, that these three framework factors need to be balanced, but they won't necessarily be balanced in how they are addressed in the growth management plan. And I have some questions around community cohesion as um, one of the concepts behind the impacts or consideration. So Heather, when you were outlining through, through you, uh, Chair, the impacts for us to consider, you mentioned city revenues, climate change, agricultural rural lands, growth potential, transportation, housing mix, housing distribution and servicing. And I was just wondering through you if you could um, explain to me whether or not the GRIDS 2 process or the MCR process forecasts with an equity lens so that we can plan in a way that, only, that not only avoids the pitfalls of historical planning decisions that have uh, concentrated certain outcomes of population um, in, in the historically planned and zoned uh, areas of our city and ensuring that we're not uh, using a hindsight lens when we're looking at how we're intensifying in new growth areas. So I guess it's a two-part question. One is, can this process forecast with an equity lens? in a way to help address the historical stratified population impacts. So when we talk about health impacts, uh, social impacts, economic inequalities uh, that are concentrated in certain parts of the current urban defined built environment. Um, and when we're planning from a perspective of developing our city fully east and west, um, how, white, how might we use growth to help address some of these historical inequities? Heather? Uh, through the chair, there, I mean, there's certainly an, an opportunity as we work on establishing how we're going to evaluate uh, growth options uh, to use more of an ex equity lens and look at social impacts and, and health impacts. I think that that's certainly warranted. Um, in terms of addressing historical uh, concerns, uh, that, I'm, yeah, we'd have to think more about that in terms of how we fit historical inequities into our planning process going forward. Um, other than that, we can learn certainly some lessons perhaps that we, mm -hmm. we don't want to repeat, but I think it certainly overall, we, we need to address those concepts as we look at evaluating uh, going forward. Thank you, and Sorry. primarily if we're thinking about intensification as an opportunity to realign resources, as it was mentioned earlier, excuse me, <clears throat> losing my voice today. Um, intensification also, I think, provides an opportunity to increase access to existing services um, that have been planned for. And so when we're thinking about concentrating uh, affordable housing, that we're doing so in a way that is clustered um, beyond, I think, uh, I guess, areas where, where we would perceive the need being, and instead, move towards mixed communities and more social cohesion in areas of our city that might not have a lot of affordable housing currently, uh, but might be resource rich in terms of services and community resources. So happy to continue the conversation um, as this process unfolds. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. And I'm going to ask Councillor Vanderbeek to take the chair. I uh, have a couple of questions myself. Uh, so, uh, picking up on, on uh, Councillor Nan's comments about the affordable housing, uh, I definitely concur. And, and I'm not quite sure how that fits into the GRIDS process, if it's a separate process. But as, a, as a, for instance, in the Waterdown area in Flamborough, uh, we do not have 
enough affordable housing, and we are desperately in need of it. So, at, you know, how are we looking through that lens as part of this process, or are we not? Heather? Or Anthony? Through the chair, I would affordable housing isn't directly, I would say, a, a part of, uh, as we look at growth allocations and targets and how we're gonna meet those, those targets. Uh, certainly, that being said, we have on our, our grids working group, we have um, staff from our housing group who um, alert us and, and let us know about the, the need for affordable housing. And as they work through the update to the action plan, uh, we're certainly working with them and keeping in touch on that. Um, certainly, though, I would say as we plan for increased intensification, though, that does have the potential to increase the range of housing options in the community, which could then uh, ben be a benefit overall to looking at affordable housing options in communities. Uh, but in terms of directly addressing affordable housing through this process, it, it's, not, it's not a direct. Uh, Councillor? Yeah, and thank you. I, I, I appreciate that answer, I really do. And, and I think the work that's been done here in the presentation is fantastic. But I can tell you from experience that having mixed types of housing absolutely does not ensure that there is affordable housing. All I have to do is look at water down. It is not affordable. Even a lot of the people who live up there, they cannot afford it. They certainly can't afford the taxes. And we have ta high taxes across this, high, this entire city, so I'm, I'm not gonna go off on that rant, at least not in this meeting. But you know, it, it does not ensure that there is going to be, and, and I'm not talking about affordable housing as in the term that you might think, you know, and geared to income. I'm talking about people who are um, downsized or out, outsized out of their community. They can no longer afford to live there, but they've been there for 40, 50 years. Many of them are seniors. They don't want to leave their community. Where do they go? That's my question. That's what, you know, what I'm looking at in terms of, of it just being affordable. I have a question, if I may, Madam Chair, through you to Anthony. Anthony, I just want some clarification. I thought in your presentation, I heard you use apartments and that there would be multiple apartments developments happening between a certain time frame. Did I hear that correctly? Anthony? Uh, yes, uh, through the chair. The apartment unit example was provided just to give an indication of the scale of development that is involved under the forecast scenarios. And depending on the low or the current trends or the high forecast, the range of new apartment units that's required, because most intensification, not all, but most intensification occurs through apartment units. Just looking at the allocation of growth and the shares by housing unit type, the city, in order to achieve the growth plan forecast, or depending on the range that we're looking at, would have to accommodate somewhere between 20 and 30,000, 20 and 35,000 apartment units over the entire period to 2041. And when you look at the average size of apartment buildings, I think we picked 200 units mm -hmm. per building on an annual basis. That equates to somewhere between four and 10 new apartment buildings under construction at all times in the city of Hamilton from now to 2041. So, and that's just apartments. It doesn't take into account the ground related units that are going to be required to achieve the target as well. So really it was, yes. Mm. Uh, so I, pre I appreciate that answer, but I just need some clarification. What is your definition of an apartment? Are we talking about a rental unit or are we talking about condos? Oh, well, we're talking about high rise residential apartment units, which, which could be in a condominium form, uh, which could then be rented or there could be purpose built rental. We, we haven't done that part of the analysis yet, but I would say based on the experience of some other communities, the, the purpose-built rental market is picking up steam and we are seeing more of it in some of the older communities in the city of Toronto. So I would expect that to be a part of the picture going forward. Uh, but really from a development perspective that that was meant to illustrate just the scale of development in terms of physical structures that'll have to be new in likely concentrated in central Hamilton over the period to 2041. And uh, so, Madam Chair, the, the, the problem I have with that is that there is a big difference between the terms of condominium and between the term apartment. Because when people hear apartment, in most cases, I would suggest that they think of rental units. A condo is specifically a condo. It is for purchase. Yes, it can be rented, yep. but very seldom at any kind of an affordable cost. 
So, you know, a person who wants to rent a condo, they could probably afford to buy it for the, for the very same monthly mortgage payment. So I, I think when we use language, I would really like to ensure that we're using language as, it, uh, with a meaning that is understood by the majority of people. You know, because I, I got a little bit excited when I heard apartments because I'm thinking, yay, there hasn't been an apartment building built in ages. Certainly haven't seen one up in Waterdown. We've got condos right across this city. Maybe they're selling, but we need rental units. And I particularly need rental units up in Waterdown. But so does the rest of the city. So if we could please temper our, our language to ensure that it's, it's the definition of what I would say the majority of the people understand. So I appreciate uh, you taking that under advisement. Yes. And Madam Chair, my very last comment, uh, it would not be a planning or, or um, a growth-related meeting conversation if I did not bring up the Waterdown Bypass. And I am going to bring it up because what I've been hearing in this presentation is that ideally we want to build the infrastructure before we approve the developments. I'd like to hear if what has happened in Waterdown is going to be used as an example, as Councillor Johnson said with Binbrook, of what you do not do. Because what that community is dealing with right now, the amount of development that has been going on for the last 10, 15 years, we have not had a new road built until just recently. So I'd like someone to provide some sort of a comment. We're on the road now, I understand that, pun intended, to get the bypass done, the developers are on side, at least that's what I heard a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm not looking for an update on that. I am just looking for how do we ensure that does not happen across the city again to any of our residents. So through the chair, I think one of the key differences in terms of what's being proposed through the GRIDS 2 processes versus the water down process, uh, and I hesitate to even call it a lesson learned because I don't think it, was, it wasn't the city's intent to do this. It was the way the board ultimately ruled on the, ruled on the boundary expansion, Absolutely. but it is to move the boundary expansion, should there be one, and any secondary planning work forward concurrently so we don't run into the situation where we have a boundary expansion followed by applications for plan of subdivision and, and what happened in Waterdown was, was, uh, was development by subdivision approval. Uh, and it was a little more ad hoc because that got ahead of the secondary plan process. So I think what's been discussed earlier around trying to keep those items moving in parallel is such, so that you can have, what, what is the goal with something like Fruitland Winona, where you would have the block structure, the block servicing plans, the, the basic road network, all part of the overall secondary plan approvals before you get individual landowners coming forward draft plan by draft plan to have their indiv individual developments approved. Um, so I, like I said, I wouldn't call that a lesson learned because that was the intent with Waterdown as well, um, but it didn't roll out that way because of the uh, um, individual landowners appealing their individual draft plans to the board and then getting approved on a bit more of an ad hoc basis. Yeah, and, and Madam Chair, I mean, I certainly appreciate that, and I do not entirely hold staff to, to account on this. There were a lot of extenuating circumstances, many of them driven by outside of this building that, that created that, uh, I don't even want to call it an anomaly because it's just, it's a disaster, it's ridiculous. Uh, but I want to ensure that when we come down the road to Alfrida and for further development in Winona, that we don't have something similar and now we're hearing, you know, potentially within Waterdown and Binbrook, uh, 10 he hectare up to 25 acres, to translate it, um, in, you know, increase, increasing the boundary into, into the green belt. I don't want to see that up there. I don't want to see any more development up there that cannot be handled. What we've got and what is coming cannot be handled by any of the new infrastructure that's coming to begin with, let alone uh, even another little development. So... Those are my comments, rant over. I will take the chair back and I'll go to uh, Councillor Brad Clark for a second time, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Just two follow-up questions for some clarification. So I listened intently to the conversation between Councillor uh, Johnson and staff with regards to 20 Road. And I'm reading on the note to Appendix C, which is a, a map. The 20 Road Eastlands were not included as part of the preferred option 
Council directed through motion that these lands be incorporated in the next comprehensive review, which will occur through grids two. So does that mean that 20 roads, 20 road lands are presently being evaluated as a part of the MCR grids two process that we're undertaking? Heather? Through the chair, the, those lands will be uh, evaluated as growth options going forward, as a growth option going forward. We haven't reached that point in the process where we're evaluating growth options, but they will be included. So the assumption that everything is in Alfrida in the grids two process is not accurate. There are other lands that will be evaluated as a part of the land needs assessment as well as the MCR and grids two process for urban boundary expansion solely. Through the chair, Alfrida is the preferred growth option to 2031. Beyond 2031, all of the white belt lands are considered as okay. growth options. Thank you, that helps a great deal. Um, the second question is about policies let me back up a bit. So the government has now moved to allow private landowners the opportunity to apply for urban boundary expansions for 40 hectares. Um, and, and then the Finbrook one is 10 hectares. So they're both urban boundary expansions that could come through for private, through private applications. If I understand it correctly, the policy indicates that municipalities' decision is final, which means I'm assuming it's not appealable to LPAT. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, um, it is correct. There, there is a difference in that uh, the 40 hectare privately initiated expansions, which we've spoken about before at this committee, uh, can be privately initiated and can be in advance of the Municipal Comprehensive Review. The, if it, the 10 hectare expansion potential expansion from Binbrook or Waterdown could only occur as a municipally initiated expansion as part of the Municipal Comprehensive Review. So they are different in that way. Uh, but um, the Municipal Comprehensive Review process will uh, be ultimately approved with an official plan amendment under Section 26 of the Planning Act, which is not appealable. And the, uh, those uh, interim privately initiated urban boundary expansions in advance of the Municipal Comprehensive Review um, are also protected from appeal under the Planning Act in that uh, there's a provision that states urban boundary expansions cannot be appealed if a decision is made by council to deny the application. So what process and policies have we now established for the receipt of privately initiated applications for urban boundary expansion. If it's falling outside of the MCR, at the present time, I'm not aware of any policies that we ha would have in terms of how we would be assessing these applications, deemed since they're not appealable to LPAT, but they're still appealable by a judicial review. So we need to ensure that our policies are procedurally fair and that we don't abstractly say, Okay, if it's not a part of the MCR, we're just going to say no and move on because it's not appealable at LPAT. We, we can't be that draconian. We have to have clear enunciated policies that say this is how a privately initiated application will come forward. This is the mechanisms by which we will assess it, perhaps even comparing it to an MCR. But there has, it has to be clearly... We, it can't be simply because we have the right to say no and it's not appealable to LPAT. Um, I'm not comfortable with make, just jumping that to that decision. So are we developing policies in terms of how we will assess those applications? Because I understand one's already coming in. So we need to be prepared for it and we need to be treating all of those applications in the exact same manner. I know this is all new because the government's kind of making these things on the fly. But we have to make sure that our reputation is, is above board and we can't treat them ad hoc. We have to treat them through policy. So how are we going to be doing that? Mr. Thorne, Mr. Robichaud, I know this is a high-end policy, but you can see my concern. 
Just because it's not appealable to LPAT doesn't mean anything. If they, if they can turn around and go to a judicial review and say that we were procedurally unfair, we just automatically dismissed it because it wasn't a part of the MCR, we're going to have problems in the courts. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, you are correct in terms of this uh, fairness and process for the proponent. So we did through um, earlier this year, council adopted a framework for how we will receive process and evaluate those development applications using both in-house staff and peer review consultants to make a determination on the appropriateness of that proposed urban boundary expansion as it relates to the broader city's goals, objectives, and aspirations. One of the things we still haven't developed is that detailed evaluation framework. We wanted to have a preliminary framework in place that would be very much similar to the framework that we would be using for the MCR process to ensure that it comes to an outcome as to the merits of that proposal. Does that proposal create a complete community or does that proposal help to contribute to a complete community or does it achieve both? And then it balances the other series of goals and objectives. So that is the framework that we wanted to put in place in advance of these development applications being submitted. We have yet to receive an official plan amendment application for this. They're still at the requesting a formal consultation stage, but that was one of the um, evaluation frameworks or directions adopted by council to have a proper framework in place to evaluate these applications so it's not seen to be simply an ad hoc, no, we're not gonna deal with your application because we are working on our MCR process. There would have to be some sort of planning justification for refusing, recommending refusal of the application. So that is part of sort of the work that Heather Travis has been focusing on in terms of in advance of these applications being formally submitted to the city what would that evaluation matrix look like? And using the same consultants that we're helping with the grids process to provide some preliminary feedback in, uh, in developing that evaluation framework. Councillor? So if I understand correctly, Madam Deputy Mayor, there has been no OPA application filed for any urban boundary expansion from private sector yet. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, that is correct. But there has been something submitted for consultation in terms of their contemplating it, is that? That is correct. So under the city's complete application bylaw, the first step in the process is to go through a formal consultation meeting and the outcome of that formal consultation meeting will be to identify what reports, studies or other information that is required to be submitted with their application in order for their application to be deemed complete. We received the formal consultation application request about a week ago, two weeks ago. We had some, uh, and some follow-up information was just recently received. We can now proceed to open up the formal consultation uh, request as an official file, circulate it to the various commenting departments and agencies, and schedule a meeting of the development review team where we will sit down and uh, identify those reports, studies, or other information that is required to be submitted with the application and then the timing for the landowner to then prepare those materials and submit is with them. Uh, our formal consultation document is good for one year, but it can be extended. And then they will, once they have all the traffic studies, what sub watershed studies, et cetera, et cetera, once they have all of that information, they will then submit it to the city. If all of the information requested has been submitted, we will then deem the application to be complete, circulate it and process it as an official plan amendment application. And that's consistent with our normal process. So that is happening over here. But over here, we don't have that detailed evaluation protocol that we're going to be put in place for how we're going to be assessing private sector initiated urban boundary expansions. So what's the timeline on that defined policy? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, we currently framework. have a draft evaluation framework that's just we're waiting for review from comments from the various other departments and agencies to see to ensure that the framework addresses their issues and concerns, but we are recognizing the time sensitivity of it in order to get that framework at least finalized internally so that we can then apply that should framework to any applications that come in as a, for an urban boundary expansion. Councillor? Your best guess on how quickly we can expedite that? My concern is not having it in place and we're going to be asked to start evaluating and then we're, we're in that box that I don't want to be at a JR over this. Through you, Madam Chairman, I would like to have that framework in place for roughly December 1st so that we can make any applicants aware what we would be looking at in terms of an evaluation framework for privately initiated 
uh, urban boundary expansion. So when they walk out of that FC meeting, they would also know what sort of criteria the city would be looking at applying to any application as opposed to retroactively applying it to those applications and then getting into a question of fairness if we retroactively developed criteria and started applying it that they had no, never seen before and weren't able to yep. adjust their application to respond to what that framework is. I'm very pleased to hear that. I, I had not uh, talked to Steve about this in advance, so this just came up as we were listening and thinking, okay, if we extrapolate, this is a possibility. So I'm glad they're going down that road. December 1, I think, is timely, and I, don't, I think that we can still handle all of any other applications that are coming in. So I look forward to that. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I have no other speakers. Uh, now, committee, we have lost quorum. We have lost quorum, and so uh, we are not getting it back. What we will do is on the next GIC agenda, this will be put on as an item to be received at that point. And we will just uh, continue on. So I can't have a motion to adjourn because we don't have quorum, but we will deal with all of that at our next GIC meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, staff. An excellent job by all. Thank you.